Hello, everyone. I hope that you have enjoyed your lunch. We're going to, of course, you're more than encouraged to continue your meal and to enjoy the desserts and coffee in the back of the room, to which I believe soft drinks have been added, hopefully. But uh, as you conclude your lunch, we're going to have a uh, somewhat brief talk uh, on uh, the man for whom this conference is uh, named and whom we're remembering after 75 years, uh, Carl Henry. Our speaker is uh, Kayla Morell, who is uh, the historian at Capitol Hill Baptist Church here in Washington, D.C. Not many churches have their own full-time historian, but Capitol Hill Baptist is a very unique church, and our speaker is a very unique person. Carl Henry was at Capitol Hill Baptist for 40 years, and so a big and played, I believe, a central role in its uh, revival uh, dating back to the 1970s. So he's a big part of the story of that church. So Caleb is going to share about his discover, archival discoveries regarding Carl Henry. So this will be new and amazing and maybe shocking information for you. So thank you, Caleb. Well, Mark certainly set a high bar for me. I will try not to be too shocking. Uh, it's good to be with you. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Capitol Baptist Church. Um, as Mark just mentioned, Carl Henry was a, a member there for a long time, so it's only appropriate uh, to share a little bit about his impact on that congregation and uh, through them elsewhere. And as Mark mentioned, for the last two years or so, I've been conducting research on the history of Capitol Baptist Church for a book. And in the process of uh, digging through our archives, I made the most surprising discovery. I found two folders of handwritten notes and letters uh, by Carl Henry. And I contacted Trinity. I asked them if they had copies of those. They didn't. I asked Wheaton. They didn't have copies. So as far as I know, these are original documents that only we had uh, collecting dust for decades in our basement <laughs> under the baptismal pool. Uh, so what would have happened if they had been lost? I don't know. In any case, there are hundreds of handwritten documents documenting a Sunday school class that Carl Henry taught from 1962 to 1964. And I think these notes reveal a glimpse into uh, the great theologian as church member. Uh, we see a little bit about what Carl Henry believed his personal mission was in coming here to Washington, D.C., not just to lead Christianity today, uh, but to serve the capital in a more specific way. Uh, as you know, Carl Henry came to Washington in 1956 to launch Christianity Today, and he immediately joined the Metropolitan Baptist Church, uh, as it was then known. And the story, perhaps apocryphal, goes that Billy Graham first told Carl Henry to go to Calvary Baptist Church. He said that's where you'd make all the connections. Uh, but Henry went and uh, decided against it, instead being drawn to the doctrinal and expositional preaching of Metropolitan's new pastor over on Capitol Hill, a man named Walter A. Pegg. Uh, Pegg had also just come to the capital from Southern California. And when Henry arrived in Washington, literally the day after joining Metropolitan, he wrote to the church's new pastor about assembling a group of influential evangelicals in Congress. Here's what he wrote. We have tried to get a list of the religious preferences of the 85th Congress, but we've been told that the National Council has the only list which has been compiled and it has refused to release it as yet. The National Council of Churches, of course, would be representing uh, the more mainline or perhaps liberal uh, denominations, uh, and Carl Henry, of course, representing the more evangelical or conservative. Uh, he speculated that perhaps they only released the list to preferential circles. In any case, he says, the point of my letter is that some organization ought to be set up, it seems to me, by a church of the stature of Metropolitan on the edge of Capitol Hill, which would know the identification of the Baptist members of Congress. Uh, so what Henry's thinking about here is uh, we need to have some influence here on Capitol Hill. He was just shocked at the disarray and disorganized state of evangelicalism in the nation's capital. Uh, by 1962, he had filled his responsibilities at Christianity Today sufficiently uh, to be able to set out on this project. And what he did is he started a Sunday school class. He called it the Hilltoppers. It was an invite-only class for evangelical elites. Uh, they met weekly at 9.30 a.m. in the pastor's study of Metropolitan Baptist Church uh, to do Christian worldview analysis of contemporary events. That's how he pitched it, Christian worldview analysis. Uh, in the group were Senators A.T. Robertson, 
Senator Strom Thurmond, military generals like Charles Landon and Paul Watson, lobbyists like National Right to Work President Reed Larson, and public intellectuals like Dr. Clyde Taylor. Uh, so if Carl Henry wanted to put together a, um, a list of influential evangelicals in the Capitol, he had found it. Each class followed roughly the same format. Uh, the moderator, usually Carl, when he wasn't traveling, he would assign passages of scripture to read. Uh, he would then allow 15 minutes of discussion of the text by a panel that he had selected. And then it would open up to larger group discussion. And the idea was just to get participants talking, uh, to get them sharing their perspective on world events, uh, particularly in light of scripture. And at the end, he would often conclude with his reflections. And uh, the rest of my comments largely come from those reflections, because he took pretty thick notes uh, during the discussion, both of what he planned to say and comments on what others said during the discussion. And it's fun. You can kind of track these uh, weekly Sunday schools alongside his editorials for Christianity Today. Mm -hmm. And you see that there's a relationship between the two. Sometimes he's drawing direct inspiration uh, from the class in his editorials for Christianity Today, and sometimes vice versa. And the topic that they spent most of the class addressing uh, from 1962 to 1964 was communism. Communism was a big deal in the 1960s, in case you didn't know. Uh, 1962, you may remember, was the, perhaps the closest the world has ever come to nuclear war. It was the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October. Uh, this was obviously a hot topic. Vietnam War was very much underway. And communism was largely recognized as the greatest existential threat to America, uh, to dem democracy, and to Christianity. It's, it's hard for us to grasp that today uh, in light of where we stand. But if you, if you were there in the 1960s, uh, it very much felt like uh, everything was heading in the direction of communism. Um, so you have an existential threat. You have a crisis in American history. You have a gathering of evangelical leaders. What does Carl Henry do? Uh, he specifically used the threat of communism as an opportunity to illustrate the insufficiency and impotence of liberal Christianity. That's one goal in the class, to demonstrate the impotence of liberal Christianity to withstand the onslaught of communism. And the second thing he does is he uses the threat of communism to demonstrate the need for a biblically grounded Protestantism, evangelicalism, in public life. So he sees it as an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to kind of put forward his life vision. How does he demonstrate the impotence of liberal Protestantism? Well, he gives four reasons, and I'm going to quote here from an extended section uh, where he reflects on the insufficiency of liberal Protestantism to meet the challenge of communism. Um, he addresses four aspects, uh, his view of creation, history, revelation, and ethics. He writes, liberal Protestantism's concessions <laughs> to evolutionary theory are such that it has no consistent or convincing view of the primal givenness of things, that is, of the original structure of creation over and against the communist view. Second, its concessions to secular theories of history are such that it compromises or loses the historical manifestation of God in Christ by tending to view the historical Jesus as non-supernatural or by distinguishing the Christ of faith from Jesus of Nazareth so that the kingdom of God is left with no more historical vindication than the communist vision of a classless society. Third, its concessions to anti-intellectual philosophies are such that divine revelation is deprived of rational propositional form and of universal validity, so that communist theory cannot be confronted by transcendent principles and fixed values on the basis of divine disclosure. Fourth, its rejection of intellectual revelation strips liberal Protestantism of an authoritative exposition of the nature and will of God, so that it must rely mainly on conceptions of social ethics, which liberalism also fails to ground in an assured basis of revelation in confronting communist theory. What he's saying is that if America is going to withstand the onslaught of communism, it will not happen through liberal Protestantism. Liberal Protestantism is already dangerously infected with the same germ animating communism. What America needs is a public Protestant theology, a, a conservative, an evangelical public theology uh, to push back against the threat of communism. He does this by, um, by first criticizing liberal Protestantism, as we've mentioned, but also by holding out e the evangelical solutions. So in his first point, in his view of creation, 
Uh, as I already mentioned, he mentioned how the, the accommodation of evolutionary theory undermined the original structure of creation. You just think about that language today, the structure of creation, the fabric of creation, the givenness of things. Uh, things that were taken for granted in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, like gender, which are no longer taken for granted today. Uh, Carl Henry was ahead of his times in seeing the way the seeds of liberalism were undermining the givenness of things. Evangelicals, on the other hand, he said, insisted that as, as creator, all power belonged to God. And evangelicals were therefore skeptical of any attempt at concentrating absolute power in the hands of anyone because it constituted a direct attack on God's authority as creator. Second, in their view of history, as I mentioned, liberal Protestantism's denial of God's miraculous interventions made them susceptible to mechanistic notions of historical inevitability, which was a key presupposition of Marxism. Uh, evangelicals, on the other hand, uh, affirmed the sovereignty of God, that the Lord preordained all events of history uh, so unlike liberals, Henry wasn't worried about being on the wrong side of history, at least not at being on the wrong side of the communist view of history. He was worried about being on the wrong side of God's history. Finally, in their view of revelation and ethics, by denying God's inerrant revelation and scriptural, liberal Protestantism removed the absolute standard by which history and ethics are to be judged. And it's interesting, one thing that comes up in his notes is the idea of history, at least liberal history as creating false centers of history. This is the language he uses, false centers. What ideological history does is it says this is the center of history, and it creates an idol out of that thing. So in the, in the case of communism, you would have the ideal past, and you'd have the classless future, and it creates an idol of those things. He says what revelation does is it unmasks those false centers of history. And it identifies the true center of Christian history, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it says this is the true center of history and that exposes all other false centers. Henry summarizes the matter succinctly when he says, liberal Christianity confused the Marxist classless society with the biblical kingdom of God as a penalty for the loss of supernaturalism and acceptance of evolution. Now you hear how strong Henry is on, on communism and on opposing communism, even to the extent of leading a Sunday school class on that topic. And you might think uh, that Henry would have just soared to popularity uh, within certain political circles uh, for his uh, public denouncement of communism. In fact, as you may know, Henry was actually removed from his position at Christianity Today for not being strong enough against communism. Can you believe that? Uh, J. Howard Pugh, who funded Christianity Today, uh, was very dissatisfied that Henry believed that both communism and capitalism were subject to biblical critique. And very early on in the process, uh, some opponents of Christianity Today had sowed seeds of doubt in Pew's mind about uh, Henry's uh, commitment to being sufficiently anti-communist, so that eventually he was removed from that post as editor. If you want to read more about that, you can read Confessions of a Theologian. Uh, Henry spends hundreds of pages walking through the controversy. <laughs> you can help yourself to that. In any case, what lessons are there for, for us today uh, from Henry's example? I'll mention just two here briefly. The first is that Henry shows how threats to Christianity can and should be analyzed theologically. Our theology is our greatest strength as evangelicals in recognizing and assessing and analyzing threats to Christianity. Uh, Henry did this by exposing the errors of communism and identifying the key doctrinal heads that communism was undermining, specifically the doctrine of creation, of revelation, um, of history, and of ethics. And if we would identify the, the errors in the various critical theories of our day, I suspect that if Henry were alive today, he would especially double down on the doctrine of creation and on theological anthropology. So as Christians today, we should follow Henry's example in analyzing threats to Christianity through the lens of theology. Secondly, we should remember that as evangelicals, we have the truth that our world desperately needs. Uh, Henry didn't just roll over with the threat of communism and with the cultural popularity of liberal Christianity. He saw an opportunity for evangelicals to communicate their theological convictions publicly, uh, and to, to, he expected them uh, to be welcomed. Uh, I think in our day, sometimes we can be so afraid of articulating the doctrinal truths of Christianity because we think they'll be unpopular, when in reality, those are the truths that our world desperately needs. Um, so those are a few lessons from Henry's 
example. Um, I'll continue working on this topic and uh, hope that you'll continue taking interest in, uh, in Henry, in his studies, his example. Uh, and I hope that we see even in this uh, the importance of having public theologians who are doing this rich theological study, doing it in the context of local churches. Mm -hmm. uh, what better place to serve as a platform for the work of serious theology than the local church? Thank you very much. give the opportunity. <laughs> See, he doesn't want to do any work at this conference. <laughs> Nothing. No, terrific. Uh, Caleb, thank you for that really uh, impressive presentation. As in a, speaking as an historian, there's nothing more exciting than finding lost letters that no one has found, and they tell us something new, fresh, and important. So best wishes with that project. We look forward to the book that comes out of that. That's just terrific. Well, our keynote speaker today is Paul McNulty, president uh, of Grove City College. And um, Anybody who knows the kind of the history of Grove over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, Paul has just done an amazing job in helping the college to kind of reaffirm its fundamental Christian commitments. And I'll be serving there with great delight uh, in the spring. I'll be teaching a couple of courses uh, there in the spring, be the, there on campus. Every interaction I've had with the Grove City faculty and the students over the last several years has been so impressive. So I am really looking forward to being uh, there, Paul. Paul has a very lengthy and impressive resume. Uh, I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, one of the organizations in town, uh, in D.C., has been up and running for a couple, more than a couple decades now, the, uh, the, the um, um, Faith and... Um, faith and Law, excuse me. Uh, too much coffee, I guess. Faith, fa faith and Law Group here in town, which brings together um, the policy community in D.C., the Capitol Hill crowd, public speakers, Christians, talking about the topics of the day through the lens of faith, and has been such a magnet and a, a, of, let me, let me use a different word, it's been a haven, a haven of sanity and clear Christian thinking in this, and nothing like it anywhere in the country as far as I know, and Paul McNulty was the founder of that organization with, with other men as well, um, and they have been faithfully serving this, this political community for decades, so that's just a, one of his many achievements uh, served in the White House administration, um, and so he has a policy experience, he has academic experience, civil society experience. Please, warm welcome for Paul McNulty. Thank you, Joe. I'm, I'm glad that you did the introduction. He just does a much better job than uh, <laughs> anybody I've ever run into, so that, uh, thank you for that. <clears throat> it's only God's providence. Um, and just this wonderful sort of uh, reality that here we are in 2022, that I'm speaking now after your presentation. Um, as president of a college, that its chief benefactor is J. Howard Pugh, right? <laughs> uh, we could have fun with that, but we won't go in that direction. Um, but um, well, it's a great joy to be here with you. And um, what I hope to do in my time is now to shift some attention to higher education. but. Actually, I'm going to blend uh, my thoughts uh, this way. Part is, is a um, sort of retrospective of my own journey as an evangelical involved in public life. Um, going back to the faith and law when we founded that in 1983. And um, what I've kind of learned from that experience and then how it impacts uh, what I see now is the mission, the importance of the Christian college. And hopefully that uh, you'll see the connection between the two. So my talk is actually entitled Preparing the Next Generation of Evangelicals for World-Changing Engagement. Uh, at Grove City College, we, um, we're, we have an extraordinarily, we're extraordinarily blessed with an incredible, uh, uh, dynamic, and inspirational football coach. Uh, one of his distinctive practices is to use a treasure trove of short sayings to mold and, and motivate his players. He, um, he understands the power of a four second phrase, be where your feet are, focus on your vision, uh, not your circumstances. Each of us needs all of us. And uh, by the way, the whole team of 125 players know all these phrases, which is really quite interesting. 
But one of his sayings is, for, 40, and forever. Um, it's a way of reminding his student athletes to appreciate the impact of their GCC experience during their four years of college and their 40 years of employment and then eternal life. <laughs> for, 40, and forever. Now, some of your college and work experiences may have felt like an eternity, but that's not <laughs> his point. Well, 40 years ago today, um, and by the way, many of us are shooting for more than 40 years of work, uh, but uh, it's, it works for him in this phrase. Uh, 40 years ago today, I was in my third year of law school and contemplating a move to Washington, D.C. Uh, to begin what I hope would be a career in public life. Now, I wasn't into politics. My, my dad was a, a Truman Democrat. My dad fought in World War II. He grew up on a farm in Ohio, very poor, went to Ohio State on the GI Bill, and uh, moved to Pittsburgh uh, with my mom, and we were all raised in a blue-collar neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And um, my dad was very proud of the fact that he, he voted for McGovern in 72. Um, <laughs> so I had no politics as I came out of college and into law school and even came to Washington. Um, sometimes it's, it's been said that McNulty was a Democrat when he came to DC, that's true, but it's harmful in my current job for that to be known, so I don't uh, say much about it anymore, but um, <laughs> that uh, I was. So I wasn't into politics. I didn't know what I would be doing or where I would even find employment. But that was not my principal concern. Instead, my developing evangelical mind was focused on whether my freshly minted biblical worldview was actually compatible with a career in public service. I was anxious to learn whether I could faithfully pursue my Christian calling in the halls of political power. I was, in God's kind providence, a product of a new evangelical generation that um, would strenuously uh, subscribe to a view in the, worlds of, in the words of Carl Henry that metaphysics and ethics went everywhere together. There was, quote, a distinctively related social order with intimations for all humanity. As I saw it, following Dr. Henry's influential call in 1947 for the evangelical and for the engagement of, of modern fundamentalism in public life, evangelicals increasingly embraced a more expansive understanding of God's redemptive plan for individuals and society. A major milestone, as you all know, was the 1974 Lausanne Conference on Evangelicals uh, and the enormously consequential uh, Lausanne Covenant, written by John Stott. Under the heading Christian Social Responsibility, the 2,000 plus uh, signatories affirmed, quote, that evangelism and social political involvement are both part of our Christian duty. For both are necessary expressions of our doctrine of God and man, our love for our neighbor, and our obedience to Jesus Christ. And this occurred while I was still in high school. Uh, a courageous role model for me in those days was Senator Mark Hatfield, Republican of Oregon. I came to disagree with where he settled on some specific policies, but his explicit, unambiguous, and Christ-centered profession of faith and worldview was tremendously encouraging. I read his book, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, as I was coming out of college and going into law school, and I was inspired to think of someone who would so clearly profess faith and serve in such a um, significant place in our public life. Another person who shaped my thinking was Carl Henry. In 1984, 35 years removed from The Uneasy Conscience, Dr. Henry published a book entitled The Christian Mindset in a Secular Society. Now, by this point, he appeared less concerned about the willingness of evangelicals to engage on social questions and more troubled by secular headwinds they were encountering, which he called, quote, the burgeoning secular mindset. He worried that politically engaged evangelicals were becoming discouraged by, quote, debilitating forces in American society. He specifically 
pointed to education and the media. It's interesting he said that in 1984. Yet, even as he expressed these concerns, he outlined a bold and inspiring summons to public life. For the Christian, he wrote, Politics is the obedient service of God in the midst of changing history. The norms and principles are fixed, and Christ at his return will demonstrate the superiority and durability of their uncompromised translation into history. In a society in which human beings remain free to mold their immediate political destiny, the principal politician will stimulate the conscience and will of his generation to reach for the lasting good. The political leader serves his country and God best, and his own constituency as well. If he risks all other claims to promote what he confidently believes to be right and just, the scriptural norms and principles will identify the worthiest alternatives. What a great, what a great calling, what statement of calling for anyone considering public life, and, and um, certainly a part of that very formative influence in my life. So perhaps at this point you can see how this conference brings me back full circle 40 years later to the challenging questions of Christian engagement in politics and public life, which is, of course, is just one um, expansive context of social engagement. The current evangelical conscience is still uneasy, or at least it should be, but now for additional reasons. First, the evangelical mind and muscle on both ends of the political spectrum have moved from an attention to first principles to a rigid adherence to specific proposals. There's a loss of interest in cultivating and sustaining a biblically informed framework for developing wise solutions to complex social problems. Indeed, deviation from the established platform on hot-button issues such as guns, race, immigration, and the environment risk tribal rebuke and likely ostracism. The foundations for this approach developed in the 1980s at the very time, coincidentally, that more moderate evangelicals were focused on domestic and international social justice questions. In a 1981 essay by Reverend Jerry Falwell entitled The Fundamentalist Phenomenon, the prominent founder of the Mormon majority asserted that his organization is political, quote, and is not based on theological convictions. The Mormon majority's purpose, and the same could be fairly said about Pat Robertson's Christian coalition, is to oppose, quote, moral cancers that are causing our society to rot from within. Falwell challenged evangelicals to turn away from academic acceptability and, quote, stop trying to accommodate the gospel to the pitiful philosophies of unregenerated human, unregenerate humankind. You have the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And I think it's fair to say that the moral cancers of the 1980s have spread within the human community and remain largely unresponsive to political treatments. However, this is not an excuse for Christians to abandon the calling of the principal politician, to quote Dr. Henry, who is prepared to stimulate the conscience and will of his generation, employing scriptural norms and principles to reach for lasting good. Now, a second reason for the evangelical conscience to remain uneasy is the breathtaking decline of kindness by expressed believers towards all perceived opponents, including and particularly fellow Christian followers. Christ followers. Des uh, desperate times seem to justify desperate measures especially with social media. Anyone who follows David French is well aware of, his, of this scandal. He recently wrote, the idea that the times are so hard that they somehow relieve Christians of basic obligations of kindness, honesty, or humility actually renders the church 
an oppressor. It can make us even more cruel than the alleged enemies we seek to defeat. Russell Moore, in his 2022 foreword of Carl Henry's Uneasy Conscience, reminds us that Dr. Henry, quote, proposed that, that gospel Christians hear what they were already saying, that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. Moore then writes, that would require Christians to seek a kingdom that speaks both to the cosmos and to the person, both to the community and to the individual, both to the body and to the soul, both to faith and to obedience, both to mind and to the conscience, both to love of God and to love of neighbor. Moore then concludes with this, every generation or so, we need a reminder of how the conscience can work to evade the parts of the word of God it wants to evade. We need that reminder now as much as ever. The evangelical conscience is, after all, still uneasy after all these years. How then will evangelicals rebuild the walls of scriptural fidelity in public life? Since God has called me these past nine years from DC to GC, I am particularly appreciative of Dr. Henry's wise words about the critical importance of education. He notes, quote, beyond doubt, the time is here for an all out evangelical education movement. The maintenance of evangelical colleges and universities with the highest academic standards promises most quickly to concentrate the thinking of young upon the Christian world life view as the only adequate spiritual ground for a surviving culture. Now, by the way, um, I'm especially impressed with Dr. Henry's admonition to churches to build college facilities rather than worship structures that only get used once or twice a week. So in the uneasy conscience, you might have seen that section where he said that he doesn't understand why churches build these big buildings. They ought to build college buildings that then they would use. I think that's a brilliant idea and so if any of you of your church would like to come and build um, <laughs> men's dormitories, we'll let you worship inside those dormitories. But I think there needs to be a movement along that whole idea of Dr. Henry's about building church, uh, college buildings. Anyway, I'd like to suggest briefly uh, three ways today's Christian college should be equipping its students for this cultural moment. And... Um, I'm kind of got this uh, reputation on campus for being obsessed with uh, alliteration, so I'm not going to give up on it. I'm just going to continue to uh, be that guy. But um, so my three points are worldview, wisdom, and winsomeness. Worldview, wisdom, and winsomeness. So first, uh, the work of equipping must begin by a biblically grounded theology of social engagement. Henry stresses the importance of a biblical anthropology as a critical and distinguishing starting point in this work. Here's where he writes. The fundamentalist holds that primal man was a divine creation, endowed with moral righteousness, so that man is not a sinner by a necessity of his original nature, as materialistic uh, determinism would um, insist, but rather by voluntary choice. Consequently, the hope for a better order is directly proportionate to the appropriation of redemptive grace in human society. I love that language. The appropriation of redemptive grace in human society. We think about the vision for redemption, the redemption of creation, the reconciliation of all things to Christ, and his language of an appropriation of redemptive grace to human society. This should be the energizing vision for Christian college students. Uh, one of the, uh, that the uh, secular academy, which is preoccupied with the indoctrination of progressively approved social justice policies, cannot provide. Now at Grove City College, every one of our 2,200 students, regardless of 
major must complete a 15 credit hour core of humanities courses involving biblical studies, history, philosophy, literature, and the arts um, for the purpose of building and strengthening a Christian worldview. The integration of faith and learning across all academic departments further equips, further equips them to be world changers in their various callings. We want them to have an eschatologically orthodox kingdom now sense of calling. Kingdom now sense of calling. And I love the um, discussion this morning about the theology of place because um, when I think about how that work gets done, it gets done in a context of community in which um, students, iron sharpening iron, working together learning, um, and appreciating the community that they have um, allows them to move from that environment into the larger world, the larger culture, with an appreciation for um, what it means to be local and present, and at the same time to have learned these incredibly important um, biblical truths as, as their foundation. So that's the first point. The first point is um, to be grounded in uh, theological convictions, but those which have um, a, an exciting uh, vision for the reconciliation of culture to what God had created and what he intended. The second thing, then, I think is necessary in the, um, the training of the next generation to be world changers um, is this idea of wisdom. Christian college students must be equipped to think and act wisely. The issues of primary concern for society will not be resolved in a polarized political environment where evangelicals show greater loyalty to a political candidate or party than, than they do to biblical norms and principles. The world needs Christian leaders capable of making prudential judgments employing theologically sound and robust, rational capacities. Um, the, the sheer number of ever-changing and perplexing issues requires this capacity. Uh, it's not even practical to just sort of adopt a platform with all the complexity that exists and continues to unfold. And this proverbial form of wisdom is indeed a tall order in our current environment. But we know that God grants wisdom to those who fear him. This is our, our sure hope. And then thirdly, winsomeness. The Christian student must learn that virtue is not an option. It's not just what the what of public policy, it's also the how. As God's image bearers, they are called to reflect the character of their heavenly father. Why does Jesus say, for example, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God? Because as a peacemaker, we take on the image of the God of peace. We, we are called to be um, living out this idea of God's image, as Paul challenges us. And so um, by having an appreciation for uh, being um, image bearers, which again, I you know, the Christian college is a unique position to be able to um, teach and, and emphasize, then we start to have a deeper appreciation for how important it is to honor the Father and to be um, the kinds of sons and daughters uh, that he has um, given us the privilege of being through his Son. You know, Peter's um, words in Second Peter summarize this mandate quite clear. This is from 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers, partakers of the divine nature. For this very reason, make every effort, make every effort 
to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Where these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And therefore, brethren, be the more zealous to confirm your call and election, for if you do this, you will never fall. So there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I like Joel this morning that you talked about this aspiration to take on the character, the, the character of Christ. And that's, that's the other critically important thing um, for our students to learn. So it has to be about you know, how they think, the wisdom that they are um, skilled to use from that solid foundation, and then the consistency of their Christ-like character in bringing those truths and bringing that wisdom to bear. I think that's what captures what Carl Henry was saying in his call um, to, um, to engage, and I'm, I'm talking particularly in the context of public service, but to engage generally um, in the uh, social uh, issues of our day. But here's some good news. From what I've observed, young Christian adults are ready for this reformation. They're distressed by polarization and this uh, worldliness so present among professed Christians. They crave godliness. They love community. They want an authentic faith. And they're ready to take up the calling of faithful presence. That's what I'm experiencing. I um, have a Bible study on Sunday evenings with a group of guys, seniors and juniors, just kind of a networky thing of one guy talks to another guy, says, come over, present me, always says, let's do this. And I am just so struck by how we're working through James, which is very practical, but how they are so attentive to the call to godliness and how important it is for them to understand how they are to live in this world, to be not just hearers, but doers of the word. It's, just, it's very encouraging. So as James Hunter has so beautifully stated, we are not bound by the necessities of history and society, but are free from them. He broke the sovereignty, their sovereignty, and as a result, all things are possible. It is this reality that frees all Christians to actively, creatively, and constructively seek the good in their relationships, in their tasks, in their spheres of influence, and in the cities. May God grant that it be so. Thank you very much. We'll have a seat over there. Okay. And I am going to serve not so much as a respondent, per se, but as a friendly but ruthless interrogator. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Paul, for another just so inspiring, challenging, and thoughtful uh, talk. Uh, there are so many uh, elements, uh, themes that you raised. I, I'm not sure where to start, but I do want to ask this before I forget. I do want to get to your last point about um, the hunger and the thirst among uh, young people to be transformed. We want to get to that before we're done. Um, you raised this theme of... Um, the kingdom now sense of calling. And it's come up in a bits and pieces in our time together, but I, I, I think it needs some attention, this, this doctrine of calling, which uh, certainly has been with the church since the first earliest days. I think and it, it was there, certainly in the Catholic Church at its finest moments, and, but I think Luther, in a, in a way that's not quite appreciated, Martin Luther helped to revive the doctrine of calling. 
And now I'm going to channel some Oz Guinness here, our, our good friend Oz Guinness, who's, I think, still written the best book on calling that, that's available. The Call is the name of Oz's book. How important that understanding, that, that Christian doctrine has been to Christian effectiveness in the world. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that doctrine of calling, uh, how you are going, are you trying to go about that at Grove City, and what is your sense of how that's being received? Yeah. It's funny you should mention Oz's book on that because I have a presentation. It's kind of my closing argument as an attorney. I think of it that way uh, when we have what we call admitted student day. These are the students who are accepted, and in April they come to campus, and they're still making a decision about whether or not they're going to deposit at Grove City or somewhere else. And in that presentation, I'm, I put on, on the screen a slide that is the definition of calling that Oz has in that book because I won't remember it, because it's actually kind of a long um, uh, definition. But the idea is, that it, uh, uh, Guinness says, that, um, that, that, that this sense of calling just demands everything from us. It, it, it's it's, it's all-encompassing, uh, and it's, it's, um, it, it, it requires a certain vigorous response um, that... Um, it takes all of our energies as in life um, you know, in pursuit of, of, of who we are. So I'm trying to communicate to students that don't sell yourself short at this moment when you're trying to decide where you're going to go to school and what you're going to do. Don't get too caught up in the transactions and, uh, of, of education. Don't, don't get distracted by just a degree. Think big. And the bigger you think, um, the better off you'll be, the better you'll like a place where calling is, is is seen in that expansive way so i i, I think the, the the point of calling is that it's you know there's a lot of ways we can talk about it many here have studied it more than i have but we do have this kind of two two dimensions of it the call um that that god um brings to us and that we respond to and it it's fundamental to who we are it defines who we are and then the work that we do and in fact one of the things i, I talk about on campus a lot is that your calling now is to be a student to, to be learning and approach it like you do your part-time job or your summer job. Uh, Grove City kids are really good, good workers. They show up on time. They're very uh, humble, <laughs> ethical. Um, be that way about your studies. Like, work at it. And, and again, this is a part of your larger calling to be equipped uh, to serve Christ in his yeah, kingdom. Yeah, I just think it's a hugely important theme because we've talked about this here. Uh, several of you have raised it, the politicization of everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that can deceive Christians into thinking they should be involved in some areas of civic or political life that really they're not called to, mm -hmm. but they're, they're immersed in the news cycle and all of it. There's a line from C.S. Lewis uh, in his essay, Membership, where he says, a sick society must think much about politics, just like a sick man must think much about his digestion. Right. And that is especially true, I think, for Christians in this city. Right. The, 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 the absolute, absolutism of politics becomes the all-encompassing thing. And then, well, what does that mean for Christian calling? Yeah. Um, what does it mean for our sense of vocation? Uh, back to Lewis for a moment. I'll, I'll, I'll unpack this theme a little bit more with you. When, when C.S. Lewis was uh, uh, there in, in Oxford in 1939, the Second World War had just begun, and he's asked to give a talk at St. Mary's Church. And the talk is called Learning in Wartime. And part of what that talk does is, just as you mentioned, Paul, he is challenging the students in the midst of war when s some of their fellow students are going off to war um, to pursue their callings as academics. And wherever that might take them. That is a necessary thing for them to do in this crisis moment even, not to abandon it. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to answer the question in their minds is why go on with my studies when the world is going to heck in a handbasket, yeah. right? Isn't that like Nero fiddling while Rome burns? Yeah, yeah. And Lewis says, no, it's not, because you don't know how God is going to use your calling and vocation. So well, talk to me more about that. No, in that same closing argument I make to those students, um, and I've been doing this now, I'll be doing this April, will be my ninth time making it. Um, I pull out of my pocket the abolition of man. And I say, by the way, first of all, I want you to know that I got this book when I was a student here at the college, which was a very long time ago. And, uh, and I said, um, as in my Lewis class, and then I read that quote, um, 
about how we're too easily satisfied, which I wish I could just rip off the top of my head, and some of you might be able to. But, you know, the idea that we prefer to make, it, we're like a child who would prefer to make, like, mud pie and the mud bud cakes in the slum rather than having a day at the beach yeah and and the idea is that um uh once again that we have to have an expansive idea of calling and we can't be easily satisfied with yeah. the things that just bring us immediate pleasures and so yeah. forth and, yeah and this is all um this this is what um henry's challenge that i read what is all about yeah. um as we think about uh, engagement yeah. to, um, to think about the kingdom of god both then and now yeah yeah because the, one of the phrases you used in your talk was the the conviction the principled politician yeah the conviction politician right lord knows we need some principled politicians conviction politicians uh what is your sense of where we are in helping to produce those men and women let me put it in, in historical terms for a moment you know in, at the time of the revolution without romanticizing it the american revolution in the early colonial period you had people like uh the reverend witherspoon at princeton uh, college then the college of new jersey and he was grooming men and ultimately women grooming them for lives of public service different vocations supreme court justices legislators even a vice president and even president james madison studied under witherspoon so he had this great sense of calling and public service. Where do you think we are now in being able to produce uh, men and women of that kind of character? Because we could produce two dozen, three dozen or more world-class leaders in the colonial period, and we did. World-class leaders, not flawless people, but certainly men and women who, who are committed to country, for, country first, the common good. It's hard for me to kind of see where we are right now. Why does it seem so difficult for us to produce those kinds of leaders who have that vision for the common good, men and women of integrity and character, without romanticizing the past? There were p plenty of problems there, but it was a remarkable generation in that revolutionary and post-revolutionary generation. What is your sense of where we are with that capacity? Wh where, what, needs, what needs to be done? Well, let's see if I can give any response that's not extraordinarily depressing and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the um, well I mean if we're thinking about leaders in the political sense and when they're thinking there about a subcategory of elected leaders because let's face it in the public policy um, aspect of, of service there many more are not elected and therefore they're in a position to be able to live out their faith I worked 10 years at the Department of Justice um, I wasn't elected to that. I was given an opportunity to serve there. And so you have, um, a, you have some uh, capability to, to um, live out um, your, your core beliefs in a way that um, you hope will not um, give you an uneasy conscience when yes. it comes to, to faithfulness. Yes. But I think that our elective politics is a very bad spot right now. And um, because we, the, we, we haven't cultivated an... Uh, um, an appetite for the kind of thoughtfulness that you just described that wins. Um, instead, we have reduced it to these uh, slogans and, and, and platforms yeah. that, yeah. Um, and, and in fact, what we've seen in, in more recent times is that the more bombastic, the more um, um, sort of uh, unwilling to speak prudently and yeah. carefully yeah. is actually more successful. Yeah. Now, uh, there's been some interesting analysis in the last two days. <clears throat> some of those candidates were not successful on Tuesday. Uh, I'm talking more at the national level. They weren't successful. And there's been some talk about the idea that Maybe people are starting to see through this a bit, and they're starting to wonder, they are look for qualified There's people. a hopeful note. <laughs> uh, there's just some, some stories. Glimmer of light yeah, in the darkness. stories around the country that, that uh, people are picking up on saying, you know, this was just a, huh, that person actually sounds very reasonable, right? So it, it's, it's made to way more complex than that. And, um, yeah. But I would say I'm, I'm deeply disturbed, I think would be the way to put it, um, at the... Um, um, uh, uh, by the tone, by the content of of the um, expressions of views, and and uh, and and the example that people are setting yeah. for public yeah. life, I think it's yeah. a it, it's it's a in my and again it, yeah. starting on Capitol Hill in 1983, so 40 years ago, um, 
you know, I, I could not have imagined it being as bad as it is right now. Yeah. But it's, it's gotten really bad. Yeah. Yeah. I want to invite people uh, here at the microphone to ask questions uh, for Paul. And as you're collecting your thoughts there, studio audience, wilting wallflowers again, time to bloom. Um, uh, a question I do have for you, Paul, as well. You mentioned also uh, the need for an education movement. And you quoted uh, Henry uh, along these lines about a, a, an essential need of the church is to be involved in a new kind of education reform movement. I underlined the same lines in the book that you did. Yeah. Talk, talk to us about that, because I do. this is another, to me, immensely important aspect to this. As much as we want to emphasize the importance of the local church yeah. and spiritual formation, character formation in that context, we've got a massive problem with the institution of education because it just affects the mind of a culture, yeah. the mind of a culture. Talk to us yeah. about that. Well, uh, you know, as we've had some wonderful um, thoughts about the, uh, what the church, the local church is doing in, in so many extraordinary ways, what, you know, what happens among Christians who actually live together and um, try to live out their faith together. I think we all immediately think about our families. We think about, um, okay, if, if this is the hope, if this is the vision, this has to begin in the home. This has to begin with education. So it, it's, it's in the home specifically, but then it's, it kind of comes right into play in the way in which our children are educated. Um, the, these influences, these um, ideas that are going to shape their minds. It doesn't have to be um, specifically a Christian um, institution or educational institution, but there's just such an advantage to that if it's being done right yes. to reinforce yes. these ideas that we want to learn. So um, I believe, and I'm obviously pretty biased about this, but I believe that when you finally get to college, you're, you're you now have the capacity to think about ideas in a way that just uh, earlier you were learning the tools to be able to do this. And you want to be around people who have thought, the, had these ideas long ago and have been working them out for, yes. for literally decades or at least for years. And they um, have a, and they're, they're in this work because they want to uh, guide, shape, mold, love yeah. young people to learn these ideas yes. and to be able to live faithfully yes. according to them. Yes. That's, that's the, the vision of a Christian college. Yes. And it, it should be. And, and that's, that's a fantastic privilege to be able to learn under those kinds of people. Yes, it's one of the joys uh, of education as an right. educator. It's one of the joys of being able to be involved in young people's lives at these crucial moments and helping to plant those seeds. A few lines from Henry, and we're still waiting for our brave uh, questioner to join us here. Um, Scott, I think Scott has a great Scott. Come on up. I'm going to read a few lines from Henry Scott. You can play right off of that. This is in his chapter, The Struggle for a New World Mind. He says that the church it must develop a, a competent literature in every field of study. A competent literature in every field of study on every level, from the grade school to the university, which adequately presents each subject with its implications from the Christian as well as non-Christian points of view. Mission statement for Grove City. Send your kids to Grove City. <laughs> guys, go ahead. A perfect segue to my question. Yeah, speaking of man has five daughters. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, th that is true. As I say, five, yes, and daughters, yes. Um, I, uh, President McNulty, Scott Redd from Reformed Theological mm -hmm. Seminary. Um, on that point, uh, your calling has taken you into a variety of different places, including education. Um, I, I want to take you back to your time in the Justice Department in the Bush administration, particularly asking the question, these resources, a literature for every, every level of discipline, um, how did you think about your faith in a unique calling like the Justice Department? How did that play a role in the work that you did? And were there particular resources or voices that helped you in that endeavor? Hmm. Um, well, I had one advantage by by being at the Justice Department rather than a lot of other departments. As John Ashcroft used to say, we're the only department with a value for our name. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but his point was actually a good one in that um, at the Justice Department, uh, at least for a, a large portion of the work, uh, we're doing kind of a Romans 13 kind of thing. You know, we're, we're, we're the, uh, dealing with bad conduct and we're holding bad actors accountable. So there was, I spent virtually all of my public life, because uh, I was on the House Judiciary Committee Crime Subcommittee staff for eight years, 
and then DOJ for, for 10. So I had a lot of my time, you know, working in criminal justice and crime policy. So as a Christian, I, I had it easy in some ways to be dealing with uh, identifying and punishing wrongdoing. However, we know that there were a lot of values and judgments associated with that, and many of them get revisited. So much of the work that I, I did in the 90s with regard to penalties has been revisited as, were they too severe? Um, did we lack mercy in uh, some of the penalties for drug trafficking crimes, things of that sort? Um, and, um, and so um, one thing uh, was certain, I came to work every day with this sense that the, that the most important um, aspect of who I was was a Christ follower and that what I did had, had to honor him. And I, I'd say that, you know, you can put it into sort of two broad categories. And that sort of follows along with what I said today. The easier, not easier, but the simple one is the virtue side. That is truth telling, um, treating people well, all, all kinds of things that are really important for the most effective work of government, right? Uh, for many years, I was, um, for some years, I was the spokesperson for DOJ. Talk about truth telling. <laughs> right? No spin. You have to basically lay it out. Don't have to answer everybody's question, but you have to make sure you don't tell them anything that's not true. Um, or just being in court and, and misleading in any fashion, right? So there were lots of, uh, of challenging sort of virtue moments. But then there's the policy side and what is appropriate in terms of, of um, uh, uh, priorities, of vindicating certain people's interests. Did we not do enough on civil rights? Where do we miss? Um, what should we be emphasizing? These were all important judgments that had to be made. Yeah. I don't know, if, uh, Scott, if I can think of anyone who was especially influential. Certainly I had Christian friends who um, helped me in thinking these things through and who, their judgment um, was useful. Um, and occasionally I come across an article or something that would speak into the subject uh, thoughtfully. But for the most part, sadly, uh, you're trying to work these things out somewhat in a, a silo of um, you know, responsibility that you may or may not get right. Scott's father was the uh, first head of the National Counterterrorism Center. And I literally sat in on meetings with the president with his father. And we would look at each other and kind of wink, knowing that we were both Christ followers, <laughs> trying to do the job the right way. It was very memorable for me. Wow, fascinating, yeah. fascinating. Charles, t tell us who you are. Hello, I'm Charles. I go at Chaz Howard. I'm from Philadelphia. Good to be here with you. I also work in higher education. And so I sympathize with you in dealing with parents and alumni with strong opinions. So I'm very good. Um, I, I had a question around Christian educators in higher education. Um, because I had a, uh, I, I gave a tour to a family of believers two days ago who were looking at my school, Liberty, Grove City, and other places. And you know, tell me about your famous alumni. And I told him some of the sort of alumni who've come through our university. And he asked, uh, what about the professors who they had? Were any of them believers? I obviously don't know every person's you know, schedule or uh, I, you know, the grades or anything like that. But it made me think a little bit more about the calling of Christian professors and Christian sort of administrators who are discerning between working at a Christian school or working at a secular non-sectarian school. So I'm curious your thoughts on that and what advice you would give to someone who uh, feels drawn to a career in the academy. Um, their, their faith, their walk with Christ is deeply important to them. Uh, I think the asterisk in the whole thing is that there's always not, there's not a ton of jobs in, in education broadly to be a professor, um, but I'm curious your thoughts on that. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, appreciate what you know you're trying to do there. Well, first of all, I think um, there's a a kind of structural governance aspect to the question or to the challenge. Um, what do we require of faculty before they're going to actually be able to teach? And and there's multiple answers to that in terms of different Christian colleges. We've had a number of Wheaton grads here um, uh, here now and, and speaking, and, and uh, one approach is a specific statement of faith that has to be signed and therefore is supposed to lift the confidence of everyone that this person believes in, in a, 
um, more extended um, expression of the content of faith. Grove City's approach is different. We don't have a statement of faith that our faculty sign. We have a mission statement that they have to sign on an annual basis. We have no tenure. So on annually, each faculty member has to sign a contract that requires them to acknowledge what the mission is and that they adhere to the mission of the college. And then we make sure that they fully understand we attach the mission. Um, and so, um, you know, it's sort of like that, but it's a different version of that. And other schools on this spectrum may have less of a requirement that way. But I think in an answer to that question, you have to begin with, what do we expect of our faculty? And, and then I think it's a matter of discipling or encouraging the faculty. There has to be a regular effort made to um, expose them to the best thinking, uh, to um, uh, regularly support the, the continuing learning on their part as to how they do uh, integrate faith into what they're doing. Some don't even like that language, but it's just kind of hard to get around it. It, it is what it is. It, you're trying to make sure that the discipline, and some disciplines just don't lend themselves as easily to that, but that the dis discipline is being looked at as much as possible through a Christian lens. So we do a lot there to try to make that work. Um, we have, uh, we have a guest here today, Cammie Messer, whose father was actually, he's now the provost at Covenant, and he was actually our assistant dean for faith and learning. And uh, Colin Messer um, just was there particularly to do that job with our faculty, to help his colleagues grow in their knowledge of the integration of faith and learning. And we've missed Colin, so we're trying to, um, you know, fill those shoes. Um, I do a devotion at every faculty meeting on a subject related to the connection between who we are in Christ and our and our calling to teach our students, but it has to be a constant drumbeat. We bring in um, a speaker, Marsden, Noel, each year to try to help invigorate that conversation, um, and um, and then hopefully the the sum of it all is they're there really with a, 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 a an authentic desire to shape young minds for the service of Christ, and and they and they get that, and you can begin to see where that's failing, and then take remedial steps to address that problem if it, um, if it exists. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got time for another question. Uh, Mr. Tooley, I've left my watch on the table. How are we doing on time? I think we should go till 2. Okay. We'll go till 2. Uh, other questions? <laughs> Could somebody hand me up my watch over there? <laughs> Time next I hope he brings his watch to class next semester. <laughs> you could have a problem. <laughs> so, so my name is Brian Schwartz. I also am currently working in higher ed and have worked for other faith-based organizations. I'm at Pepperdine University right now. And I have, you know, working a lot with students of various ages, but especially undergraduate students. And um, over the last few years, like a lot of institutions, Pepperdine has spent more time thinking about issues of diversity and racial reconciliation. I recently picked up a book um, that uh, was written by a woman who now works for the National Association of Evangelicals on Reconciliation. I was just talking to Pastor Kim about that. And one thing I've seen in a lot of Christian institutions is uh, like some of my students or some of my colleagues who are people of color who are deeply Christian uh, wanting to bring up issues around race and the history of race within like American society, but also within their own institutions and in churches and feeling like they're not getting anywhere, constantly sort of feeling like their, um, their, their contributions are not fully welcomed, uh, especially in predominantly white institutions. And I'm just curious, like, as we think about like the role of Christianity and society on this particular question, how do we create more space in Christian institutions to not only have these conversations, but also to support, you know, brothers and sisters that really want to engage in those. And I've seen so many st people leave my institution simply because they've become so frustrated with that, people that really belong there. Um, and I'm not saying that there's things that they don't bear some responsibility in that as well, but I just think we could be doing more, and I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that, either from your perspective as a president of a university or in other you know, roles you've had uh, in society and government. 
Well, uh, <laughs> nice you, little softball question yeah, there right, for exactly. you. Man. If you uh, Google Paul McNulty or Grove City College, you'll probably understand why I wish we had ended the question time just a moment ago. <laughs> um, because this has been a big issue um, in our school for the last um, year. Um, so, you, you know, this discussion we've had about evangelicals and priorities and engagement in our culture today and the challenges that we're facing, uh, those same challenges impact schools because schools are uh, subject to the pressures from the outside in all sorts of ways. Um, Parents, in particular, um, uh, we have, again, 2,200 students, um, and we're a conservative, politically conservative um, Christian college. And, um, and so we have a lot of parents who are, um, uh, feel, have strong feelings about um, these issues. And in a world today where social media is such that someone can make a point about what was said or how it was said uh, at any given moment. Uh, we live in a time of great vulnerability and uh, opportunity to second guess and to um, speak into and to criticize. And it's a very difficult environment, a very difficult environment to lead right now. Um, and when we reflect on these um, uh, the call that we have, um, and we understand our convictions, uh, what we're, what we're um, often unfortunately forced to do is to try to reconcile that with the pressures that are being put on us as a result of different beliefs and uh, expectations that um, um, certain things are going to be said or not said uh, in a... Uh, institutional uh, educational institution so critical race theory has been the hot topic of the day and we had um, a whole dis um, uh, explosion of concern that um, came up last year I went maybe explosion is quite not quite the word but certainly a strong interest uh, of concern there that you know we had to respond to in different ways and um, some hold the view that I um, have them respond to or didn't respond to it in the way they'd like to see. Um, I'm certainly trying to just do the best I could in that situation. But that's the way it is today. This is the world we live in. It's not going to go away anytime soon. And even as our young people, and I can say this, our students, our students are far less troubled in the sense that they want to learn well and they want to learn biblical truth and understand how it impacts every area of life, including race. Um, the voices from the outside can be um, uh, not aligned so well with the way that students want. Now, here's the good news for us. Academic freedom standards are still strong. And so the best place for us is when faculty are in their classes, in relationship, over the course of a semester where they're meeting three times a week and they're reading things together slowly and they're engaged in really good conversation. And, you know, I've assured the faculty, and I think they understand, that, that in that context, uh, they need to teach what they need to teach. And so I think we're in a place where, even in a conservative institution as Grove City College, um, that the hard questions, the hard questions must be tackled and can be tackled. Um, and sometimes other events and things can distract people and we have to just manage that that but the real work gets done in the classroom and i'm confident that in the classroom and in relationships um we're being faithful to all that god has called us to and i think that's the challenge to, now maybe mine has been harder than many other institutions where they would embrace these issues without any hesitation um but um uh, we're certainly probably uh, in the Christian college world, uh, a little more unusual that way. And so it's been more difficult to manage those hard conversations uh, in this current environment. I expect, again, that environment to stick around for a while. Um, I want to end this on a happy note, so, and I'm, meaning I want to ask you that question I promised I would ask about your, the students being ready for a kind of reformation, yeah. ready to be um, 
a challenge to give their life, uh, their vocations to serve others, to serve the common good, and what you're seeing there. Um, to, to pick up this last point you just made, though, about the um, need for academic freedom, to model that in the classroom, I mean, what, what should a, a Christian institution be if not, in some sense, a place where truth is taught but also sought, huh. right? The, 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 the honest search for truth in every realm of life and human experience. There's a wonderful line from, from uh, Newton, uh, the, our great scientific forefather, um, who had a, some kind of Christian foundation to Newton. He wrote much more about the Bible, commentary on the Bible, than anything else. And the line from Newton is, Plato is my friend and Aristotle is my friend, but my greatest friend is truth. So Christian institutions that are known as places that teach the truth but also seek after the truth, it seems to me that can inspire young people. And I want to take it now to that question. What are you seeing? What, where are you most hopeful in this idea of young people seeking to be transformed, um, holding up a high standard, a high sense of calling for them? What are you seeing there, Paul, that most encourages you here at this moment? Well, I think I'm probably most encouraged by that uh, point on virtue I was talking about because I, I see the um, the more intellectual side as somewhat consistent in terms of uh, of learning the truth. In fact, there may be um, a growing concern about biblical literacy coming uh, into higher education, Christian higher education, which is um, I think um, a, a fair concern. So on the on the on the more, um, say, uh, philosophical side and, and theological uh, preparation, I think there's been a pretty uh, consistent interest uh, that you know, you're know you planting seeds and you're hoping that as time goes by, there'll be a greater appreciation for those truths. Where I'm more hopeful is, is the, the rejection of, of, of the um, kind of, of worldly character that they're observing and they're not admiring and uh, I, our students and students today I think are far less political because they're so turned off by politics and they're more interested in getting back to a, in, a, in a Christian environment what does it look like to be Christ-like yeah. and wow. that's very encouraging that's very encouraging now the sad thing is we came to a point where that was even a necessary yeah. lesson to be learned yeah. right yeah um, when we were young, there was less of sort of a, 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 a noticeable discord that we had to, you know, respond to. But, yeah. but the, the negative example now is so noxious. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> that that they, there's, I think, a general sense that there's a better way. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, there's a, the word community gets overused, but at its best, community it, it is this sense of... Um, we're invested in each other's lives. Yeah. In order to be invested in each other's lives, we have to live a certain way, yes. which includes loving one another. Hmm. And what does that look like? And, and I see that as being a real um, uh, a, a, a conscientiousness about that, that um, is, it's very encouraging, yes. actually. Yes, that sounds very much like a Carl Henry anthropology. We uh -huh. are made for a relationship with God, to love him, and to be in community and to love our neighbor. That's, that's right. That's an anthropology. We're wired for that. Right. And when we're surrounded by messages in a culture that is trying to tell us that that's not true, something, something's got to give. There's yeah. going to be a pushback. Yeah, in right? Christian higher ed, and not just Grove City, we're, we're talking a lot more about the common good. Yeah. And, and that, that resonates with students. They, yes. they, they understand what we're trying to get at yes. there, that they're equipping themselves to go into communities yes. and be present with other people. Yes. And to make a difference. Yes. And that's a hopeful thing for our society as a whole. Yes. That we would be producing so many people who would have more of that self consciousness that yes. way. Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Well, ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause here? <laughs> Paul McCarthy. We have another. Uh Another all-star panel, and let me just say, kind of parenthetically, you know, I never get invited to be uh, I'm on, on an all-star panel for reasons that I think are obvious to everyone but me. I don't get invited to be on them, but I get to moderate them. So that's pretty fun. We do have another all-star panel that is going to be addressing the question, what issues need to be addressed by evangelicals, both within our own community and outside of it, with regards to its engagement with public life, with civic life? What issues need to be addressed within our community 
and uh, uh, also outside of it. So, brief introduction. Scott Redd, President and Professor of Old Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary here in D.C., the author of The Wholeness Imperative, How Christ Unifies Our Desires, Identity, and Impact in the World. Scott cares deeply about the teaching of Scripture and its application to all situations in life, something we've been hearing a lot about over the last, uh, you know, 18 hours. Charles Howard. The Reverend Charles Howard serves as the chaplain and vice president for social equity and community at the University of Pennsylvania, his alma mater. He has been ministering to college students for over 25 years. You started like eight years old or something? Uh, what was that about? Uh, and, <laughs> and he has not been canceled in uh, 25 years. This is also amazing. Chaz is the author of five books, including most recently Black Theology as Mass Movement, and I am proud to call him friend. Aaron Graham serves as founder and lead pastor of the District Church, multi-ethnic community committed to transforming the city for Christ one neighborhood at a time. Aaron and, and his wife Amy founded DC 127, which unites churches to end the foster care wait list in DC, as well as Just Homes to expand affordable housing in the city. And baby, do we need that. I have been greatly blessed personally by Aaron's ministry, and I am grateful to call him friend. The point of this conference is just for Lacanti to hang out with his friends here uh, at, uh, at, Mar at Mark's expense, is what I should add. So, so take it away, panel. Who's first? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Who's first? I'm sorry. So just, just take it away, panel, as you were. Uh, Scott, Scott Red, and then we'll take it to Charles and then Aaron. Yeah. No that's it. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. It's a privilege to be a part of this. Uh, thank you, Joe, for including me in this conversation. I, I come, I guess, as a more of a seminary administrator, a theologian, but of the Old Testament type. Um, and I, I've been pleased to hear a lot of Old Testament being quoted uh, today. And that just warms my heart. Um, I, I would also say I was raised in a family that was politically and socially aware. I was not directly influenced by Carl Henry in those days, in the sense that I didn't come to him, I didn't actually read him until later in my adult life. But it was one of those experiences that I'm sure you've all had, where you're reading someone and you're saying, yeah, you know, I really agree with a lot. It's funny how much we agree on things. And then you realize it's because people who influenced you were influenced by him. And so I came to that realization of how deeply he had influenced uh, the world in which I had grown up and had lived in and operated even before doing my PhD and working in, in policy here in Washington, D.C., how much he had influenced so many of the voices around me. And he'd influenced it in a lot of what I would consider very healthy ways that have already been highlighted today. And one of them that I want to focus upon is his emphasis on the teaching of Scripture and the Christian life really being something that pervades, even infects, the whole of the human experience. Henry was quoted as saying, there is no room, there's no room for a gospel that is indifferent to the needs of the total man. It puts me in the mind of Deuteronomy 6, that great passage about the, the wholeness of the person being involved in the worship of God. This is a passage that, of course, Jesus and his interlocutors refer to as the greatest commandment. It's the beating heart of the Old Testament. Uh, referred to as the Shema because of its first word, Shema Israel, hear Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. The Lord is our God, and the Lord is one. And, and this, this, this creed really is what it was. It was repeated every morning and every evening in the second temple period by believing and devout Jewish people. This creed reminds them that God is one, that he's whole, and that he is theirs. Right? He is their covenant God. They don't own him like uh, an idol maker makes an, and owns an idol, but they own him. They, they have him in the sense that he is their covenant God, and they are to respond in the same way. They're to, to love the Lord their God, that's the covenant part, with all of their heart, all of their self, all of their strength. They're supposed to be one. They're supposed to be whole in their response to him. Walter Kim said earlier, uh, we shouldn't focus just on what we're saved from, but what we're saved to. And I would actually argue that's what we're saved to, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all, all of our inner self, that is, all of our soul, uh, following the King James translation, but really probably refers to the whole of the person, the body. Robert Alter 
uh, in a recent translation, translates it all of your body. And I think that's probably getting at it. It's where you stop and the world begins, right? And then lastly, all of your strength, all of, all of your effect in the world, all of your what we might call capital or estate. Think about that's financial, that's, that's relational, that's political, that's creative. Every way that you're changing the world out there should be directed to the love of God. As a matter of fact, I think Jesus is basically quoting or exegeting the Shema when he says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And we often talk about money when we talk about treasure, but I think he's talking about all of the person, everything that you're directing your energies to. See, Henry understood this whole person calling of the Christian faith. And for him, operating in a post modernist fundamentalist debate operating in that context and we really do have to read him as coming out of the aftermath of that context he's trying to answer the problem of the modern fundamentalist right and 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 dealing with the conflicts that arise in such a society in dealing with that he paints a broad and very general paradigm shifting that's what he is he's creating a paradigm shift for the christian experience in the modern west particularly in the modern in modern america and in doing so, he, he, he gives us some great broad brush guidance. And as we take that, we shouldn't expect more from him than that, but as we, as we take it and we now speed ahead 75 years forward, it does give us a bit of a trajectory as to how we check on, how we, how we measure, how we create metrics for how we're doing today. And, and, and that brings us to what we might call a bit of the problem, right? You know, Henry has directed us He's given us a guidance on how to apply the teaching of Scripture into situations in life. And yet, as we look at and as we talk to our Christian friends, and maybe even as we think about the way that we engage in the public and the social life, we have to admit that there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a fragmentation that's happening in the Christian political vision. Uh, Oftentimes, the Christian vision for our embrace or our involvement in public space is it's often episodic. It kind of pops up here and there when a hot-button issue is in the news. It's, it's often occasional, right? It's, it, it comes and it goes, but it doesn't really inform the whole of the life. As a matter of fact, oftentimes, Christian political theology is taking its lead from the news cycle. And of course, it's not the news cycle anymore that began and ended you know, at 5.30 in the evening with the evening news. It's not the 24-hour news cycle of cable news. It's now the constant moment-to-moment -moment news cycle of social media and the internet. And so I think we can all acknowledge there's a bit of a problem in the way that Christian public witness is finding expression. It has this kind of episodic and maybe even occasional uh, appearance or expression in the world. So as we approach this, being armed with Henry, I would say we need to think about how to connect that general broad base, those visions and values that he laid forward as an application of scripture. How do we connect that downstream to the everyday work that is going on in the public life? The, the quote that, that Joe just gave uh, in, in the last session, where he talked about addressing with expertise every level right? Every level of every discipline. I think that's the work that is set out for the Christian church today. How do we approach the issues uh, that are facing us in the public square and develop uh, a kind of connective tissue between the broad values, dignity of human being made in the Im image of God, the reality of a relational and personal creator, uh, the reality of common grace, of natural theology. How do we take those broad theologies, those broad doctrines, and apply them in a responsible, faithful way to these downstream issues that we're all running into, we're all wrestling with. I'm talking about issues like national security, that story that President McNulty told. I love that story of uh, two Presbyterians, two Presbyterian elders sitting across a table thinking about how you handle the issue of terrorism in the West, okay? Um, but how are we equipping, how are we, are we creating places where there's conversations where people can actually apply their basic beliefs to the, the, the intricacies of their craft? We can talk about that at the level of national security, the level of healthcare. I've got a, one of our graduates is the head of the uh, ethics committee over at Georgetown Hospital. And he's helping think through the real, the real specific issues that arise day to day in critical care. 
not just the big picture issues like abortion or euthanasia, but those issues that show up over and over and over again on any given normal day at the office. Paul McNulty would be a great resource for education. How do we think about education and education policy? How do we do that well? So I think that's the call for us today is to not just be satisfied with broad values, but to sit down and to think, how do we work through these broad values, these broad te te um, teachings, and create a uh, connective tissue with the downstream policy activities that Christians are wrestling with every day? That does mean more theology, not less. And when I say theology, I'm not talking about a kind of esoteric ivory tower kind of endeavor. I'm talking about applying scripture, as we've already said, to every situation in life. This assumes a kind of organicism. That what God says about himself and about the world has an organic relationship with the world that we see around us and that we're engaged with. The Bible doesn't tell us everything that there is to know about these issues, but it does give us all of God's words that we need for these issues. And so I think we can sit down with our scriptures and we can develop the kind of active principles that will guide us in these day-to-day -day issues. And lastly, I'll kind of end with this. We start with kind of the connective tissue between teaching of scripture and practical effect. Um, we talk about more theology and not less. And finally, I would just end with this. I think this needs to be one of our guiding principles. And that is developing a positive, a positive public theology, a positive, a positive political movement going forward that is not just merely reactionary not just responding to whatever's in the news, but is offering a positive, um, God-glorifying vision for the role of the Christian in the civic and the public life. And so I think Henry set us down on that trajectory, but 75 years have passed and we still have a lot of work to do. And I think conferences like this are wonderful. I love hearing these voices and considerations in this endeavor. Thank you. Really strong, man. Thank you so much. Uh, I kind of want to hear more about positive uh, contributions that are constructive and less reactionary. So, but we'll questions later. I know that. <laughs> um, thank you for letting me be with you all today, and for the grace and hospitality uh, you all have shown uh, these last several hours to me and my daughter, who was amazingly underdressed when we walked in today. <laughs> Um, and was reminded so by some people who work here, and yet the grace that particularly folks at our table showed her um, was very Christian of you, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, and and, and got to give a shout out to, to Uncle Joe, as he's known in my house, uh, my brother uh, Joe Lacanti, who I've known for about 20 years now, and uh, Joe and I are family, uh, yet we really disagree on a lot of issues. And we have remained, uh, I think, interlocutors and, uh, and brothers over that time. And so I, I love you, and I'm, uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, my man. I, I wanted to share, uh, frame my remarks in a, in a brief story, if that's okay. I, I grew up in Baltimore, just up the road here from here, uh, and I was an orphan. Both my parents died when I was young. And my older sister took me in and became my legal guardian when I was 11 years old. And in so many ways, like, uh, my faith formation was under her watch. She kind of rescued me um, in, 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 in many ways. She's very much a hero in my life. She was 23 years old when she took in an 11-year-old. And I was like this size in middle school. Uh, I was a big boy. And she was trying to figure out like, what to do with me in the summer because she wanted a little bit of a life herself. And she found through the principal at my middle school this summer camp. And this camp gave us, gave me a full scholarship to go. And I really didn't want to go. I was going to kind of homesick, but sort of put me on the plane and then the bus to kind of get to this camp way up in Maine, Naples, Maine. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. And we get up there. It was a sports camp, all boys sports camp. They're eating like chicken nuggets and, and soda. And like, it's, it's like, and basketball and football like, is great in a lot of ways. I get off the bus, walk to the camp. It's beautiful. And I realize. I'm the only black person there. My bunkmates were wonderful, deeply hospitable, and like just like buddies who also like comic books and Michael Jordan and like, you know, all that stuff. 
the whole first week goes by of sports and like our bunk stinks because it's a bunch of 11 and 12 year old boys. And we get told to kind of get dressed to go down to the rec hall. And we go to the rec hall and, and I, I still have the letters I wrote my sister telling her about this. We walk in and someone's handing all of us like little hats. And like we all kind of put these little hats on our head and we walk in, we sit down and all the white folk in the place start speaking a different language. Hebrew. And my sister failed to mention that this wasn't just a sports camp. It was a Jewish sports camp that she sent me to. And because of I, I, rereading much of Carl Henry, for some reason, brought me back to this moment. I ended up going to that camp for 10 years. I sang the Shema every Friday night. Uh, and you know, it was a good prep for seminary because I had a good amount of Hebrew before I sort of started there too. <laughs> it was great. Um, it was also good for my confidence. Like I was, I was like a head taller than most of the other guys I was playing basketball with and whatever. Uh, I wanted to share one story from my time there though. My last year as a camper, we were going to play basketball against another camp where there's like inter-camp games and we had four guys and we needed one more to sort of field a team. And, and, and I thought that my buddy Johnny maybe could play with us. Johnny was really good at soccer, lacrosse, and street hockey. Really bad at basketball, but we needed a guy. So I asked Johnny, who really didn't want to play. So I, I, I don't want to be over there. I hate basketball. You know I'm not good at it. I'm going to stay over here in the hockey rink where it's more comfortable for me. We convinced Johnny to come play with us so we could finally have a team. And in many ways, he brought so many good things. He's like a, like, he's like a hockey guy, scrappy. He's like, like shut down defense. He's hardcore. He also fouled out in like 10 minutes. <laughs> because he was kind of ham-handed and a little rough and pretty aggressive. The three things I think that we need right now, lessons from from Carl Henry, one are to kind of like, come play. We need another guy. We need another sort of teammate out here with us. But when you come play, play nice. The second thing is to get your friend, get your uncle. And the third thing is to be welcoming. I love this call by Carl Henry, to not to be comfortable over in the hockey rink, to come get on this court too, because there's real need out there, affordable housing, orphans, homelessness, poverty, gun violence, racism, sexism, like war, all of that. We, we need the, not only the, the brilliance of evangelicals, but the hearts of evangelicals to engage these issues. And I think everybody in this room gets that. But when you come, play nice. Don't foul out so quickly. <laughs> Don't throw a bunch of elbows over here. And, 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 and I, mean, I say it in jest, but I also like, I mean it. When people think about believers now, when people think about evangelicals, what are the first things that they often come to mind? I, I, I work at a, um, I work at a, at a, what is described as a secular school. And there's a wonderful like little remnant of, of believers who are still on our campus. And when you ask people about like, what do you, you know, tell me about Christians. What do you think about Christians? They say judgmental, you know it, hypocritical, homophobes, racists, anti-Semitic, or keep to themselves. Some of that is earned, some of that is unfair. But those reputations are real. And people have caught elbows from Christians before. People have been, to stick with the analogy, people have been fouled by Christians before. So if you're going to come get on the court, play nice. The second thing is to get your friend. when Johnny came and played on our team and was just like wrecking these other guys and the other, one of the guys on there said, get your friend. 
He is a handful. He is rough. I think we needed to get our friends. There was a comment last night uh, in, in the really wonderful um, remarks and then responses where someone said, uh, are we to be, are we who are observant uh, evangelicals and Christians to be responsible for those who are not? And I think, I think it's, it's alluding to this notion how the, the people who are involved in like January 6th, insurrect, people who are involved in like the march at Charlottesville, kind of the, the sort of the ugliest kind of people who are carrying bigotry right now. We can distance ourselves from them. Like that's, that's not really, they don't really go to church. They may call themselves Christian, call themselves evangelical. They don't really go to church. They're really not us. Um, there's a convenience in that ability to distance ourselves from them. I do think there's a responsibility to get our friends, though, to not just say that's not us. I, I'll say it even more personally. Like, I need you to get your friends. I know it wasn't folks in this room who were, who were chanting, you will not replace us in Charlottesville, who had Camp Auschwitz on their shirt on January 6th. There was nobody in this room. But we're not that far from them. And as a black man in this country, I need you at Thanksgiving when a relative uses the N-word at your table to say something and push back. I will do that for you. I hope that you'll get your friend who's fouling also. The final thing is this notion of being welcoming. This is one of the great um, subtle challenges within Judaism, uh, this notion of welcoming the stranger. I told you I went to that Jewish camp for 10 years. <laughs> I was the only black kid for almost all of those years. I went to a lot of bar mitzvahs, <laughs> a whole lot of weddings afterwards. And uh, tangentially, I have been asked to do some of their weddings. I'm like, I, you know I'm not Jewish, right? I'm like, I'm not a rabbi. I'm like, I, don't, I don't think it's going to, I thought you were Ethiopian this whole time, Chad. I'm like, I don't know. They were, but so welcoming and not perfect. And we definitely had our fair share of hard conversations where people said the wrong thing. And we were a bunch of dudes and we got in fights and all that, like that happened. But they made it a home for me, as different as I was. In the same way folks at our back table made this a home for my kid today, all of you. And yet, I am the only black man in this room with pictures of white people on the walls. <laughs> I am the, I, I, you know, I'll just be honest here. I work at a liberal secular school. I would describe myself as a liberal Christian. I vote Democrat in almost every election. We were talking about communism earlier. My granddad was literally a communist. <laughs> What will you do with me? What will you do with me, the rest of our conference? Will we still be able to, to hug on the way out? I think we will, but I think we need more of that, especially in an age of deep division. So thank you for letting me be with you all today. Thank you, um, Charles, for, for sharing and for um, your story and uh, for the framing metaphor. I think, you know, we've got a lot of content, but a lot of times we remember stories. And um, I was just preaching yesterday somewhere about Paul challenging us to speak the truth in love and how we have a lot of people that speak a lot of truth but no love and then a lot of people that are all love but no truth. So thank you for, for sharing your story and challenging us. Um, so having recently read The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism, I believe that 75 years later, Carl Henry would critique Christian nationalism and progressive, and progressive Christianity in the same breath. Mm. He would critique the worldviews that lead to January 6th and the worldviews that lead to the deconstruction of biblical truth. In fact, I believe Carl Henry would argue 
today that in the majority uh, that the majority of evangelicals are actually too engaged in culture not too engaged in public life and the big issues of the day but too engaged in the uncritical pursuit of the american dream that is built on the lie of expressive individualism i believe henry would argue the church is not bold enough about the claims of christ about the reliability and power of biblical truth that is able to speak into the heart of every social issue today. Carl Henry says in his preface, while we are pilgrims here, we are also ambassadors. So the challenge throughout church history has always been to be both biblically faithful and culturally relevant, right? It's to live in the tension between these two things. Fundamentalists sought to be biblically faithful, but did so in a way where they became too separate from the culture and ended up on the wrong side of many critical moral issues of the day, as he specifies, related to war, race, class, and imperialism. On the other hand, liberals became so fascinated with becoming culturally relevant that they prioritized social engagement above biblical faithfulness and then reinterpreted many of the core doctrines of the faith to suit what Paul said, what their itching ears want to hear. So I think if Carl Henry was pastoring in the heart of D.C. today, and I love the story of him teaching Sunday school here in D.C., which is pretty incredible. I think I'm just thinking about how do, how do I pastor the future Carl Henry's? That's, that was my challenge today. Um, wow. But I think if, if Carl Henry was pastoring in the heart of D.C. today, um, among the people that I pastor, he would need to spend more time critiquing what he calls, quote, optimistic liberalism, then he would need to spend time critiquing conservative fundamentalism based on the makeup of urban D.C. My story is one of growing up as a Southern Baptist missionary kid, um, being called into the gospel ministry at 16 years old, uh, being ordained in the Baptist church, serving as an urban missionary um, for five years in Boston, and then I've been in D.C. for 15 years. And so I've been in the urban core for 20 years now. And I have seen how the evangelical church too often accommodates to culture. When we planted the district church in 2010, I thought that if I could just, like a good evangelical, get people in the front door, win them to faith in Christ, get them plugged into a small group, get them actively serving in the city, then our city would be impacted for Christ. And Brian's actually in the room. Brian was in the room when we started. I love that. Um, what I have found pastoring in the heart of DC is that without teaching the core doctrines of the Christian faith, that people will be more influenced by progressive Christianity and secular culture than they are by the word of God and the historic Christian faith. So it's interesting because so, for so much, because I grew up around conservative evangelicalism and I spent so much time trying to contextualize the faith because I didn't see it getting contextualized, making it relevant, emphasizing the mercy and the justice ministry, starting things like DC 127, starting ministries like Just Homes. But what I found among many of my peers is that in our efforts to contextualize the gospel, we have often become too adapted to culture and not distinct enough. And um, one of the ways um, that that happens is, and, and one of the things I want to really emphasize is that what I'm talking about in critiquing the over-contextualization of the urban church, what I'm not saying, and please don't walk away hearing me say that, is that we need less justice. That we, ne that we need, um, like the, the suffering, if you really hang out in the urban core, and, and, not, and now it's not just the urban core, right? Because we know poverty and injustice is spreading everywhere. But if you really hear the stories of those who are suffering, it's way worse than you think. The suffering of people is way worse than we think. So I'm not saying we need any less justice, that we need to be, um, that we need to move towards, we need to see the gospel incarnated. We need to see more sacrificial generosity. We need to see the, the chains of injustice loosed. We need to lead on issues of, of race and the racial conversation. What happens when we don't is that then the, the world leads the conversation and then we're playing, we're, we're playing catch up. And now we're, we're reacting to the frameworks of the world rather than leading as we should. But my point is, from my experience, is that we've neglected basic discipleship, teaching the Bible, teaching the power of prayer, understanding the main tenets of the faith. 
And so what's, what's interesting is that it's difficult to discern because there's a lot of young people, um, in my experience, who have, who have grown up in church and they've moved to the city. And anybody that moves to the city, like the first thing you want is community, right? So, you, so because you've been socialized in the church, where do you find community? You find community in the church. You want to get engaged in the issues of the city. So you find ways to serve through the church. However, I have found that if you don't disciple people, even people who have grown up in the church around biblical truth and prayer, that over time they will drift away. And a church not committed to biblical truth will eventually devolve into a social club or simply a social ministry over, the to- over time, and we will not disciple the next generation to fear God and to follow all his commands. In many ways, the challenge in making disciples is one that's uh, faced by churches of all theological persuasions. It's the challenge, uh, regardless of where you've grown up or what persuasion, it's the challenge of making disciples in a culture of expressive individualism, where self reigns, um, where autonomy, where, where it's, uh, I used to read those choose your own adventure books growing up. Um, it's like choose your own adventure spirituality, right? Um, Right, and, and here's the challenge. When, when my highest goal in life is my own autonomy and freedom, it becomes, it becomes difficult to near impossible to follow Jesus, which asks me to lay that down, right? Autonomy was the original sin in Genesis 3. Um, so conservatives accommodate to expressive individualism when they do not have the courage to speak truth to the systemic sins of racism and violence and economic inequality that Scripture teaches us. But liberals accommodate to expressive individualism when they allow the secular worldview to influence how they read and view scripture. Of course, you all know the book uh, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. Um, Shout out to Grove City. Um, But he references uh, the secular sociologist Paul Reef. You know, he has these three categories of culture, first culture, second culture, third culture. First culture uh, believes in many gods. It's a sense that there's a spiritual culture. Um, the, the world is a spiritually charged place. We must do things to appease the gods, our works. And so it's very much a pre-Christian culture. And then there's second cultures, which believes it's the Judeo-Christian view, which believes in one true God, uh, believes that um, that these are, this is a scriptural culture to understand that when we obey God's revealed commands and truth, that it will lead to human flourishing and justice and peace, that there is, there is um, higher truth, that there is, there is higher authority, and that we are to submit ourselves to that. I grew up as a, as a missionary kid in Liberia and Kuwait and studied uh, missiology, did my doctorate work in missiology, and I learned how to evangelize first culture how to share my faith and cross-cultural and do that. And, and, and a good missionary will learn how to share their faith across cultures in a way that doesn't colonize that culture, where you teach biblical principles, but you allow the gospel to be um, incarnated in an indigenous church planning movement over time. The, the, the problem is that many people today think that to reach the secular left, that we need to use the same methods to, that we use to reach pre-Christian culture. And, uh, and that's the world that Carl Henry and Billy Graham largely operated in, even in America 75 years ago. But the reality is that we're not ministering, at least in the urban core, in pre-Christian cultures anymore. Reef argues there's a third culture, and the third culture exists primarily to define themselves against second cultures. They believe in no greater truth, no sacred order, Instead, they, uh, they spend their energy uh, deconstructing the sacred. And so anything that restricts individual autonomy is leveled um, and left up to in- individual interpretation. And so what I would argue is that the third culture is the engine that is currently driving progressive Christianity that has led, in some people, to post-Christianity. It also powers Christian nationalism, which is not my context to critique right now, but I think we could do that too. The, the ultimate authority in third culture is, is self. And so Mark Sayers talks about this in his book, uh, Disappearing Church. He says that the, the, the challenge when you're in second culture evangelizing first culture is to not colonize them. <laughs> but when you're sharing faith with 
as, a, as, a, as the church to third culture, to a post-Christian culture, the challenge is to not be colonized by that culture. And I think that's some of the challenges that we're dealing with today. But I think, I believe that there's a hunger for God in our generation and, um, and there's a desire uh, to know him. Um, the interesting thing is I've found that it has usually been white liberals that have led the way to the progressive deconstruction of the historic faith, which is why I believe our church has become so diverse now. Our church is over 80 nationalities, and it's because white liberals don't represent the global church. White liberals might be sensitive to issues of racial justice, but they're out of step with the convictions of most immigrants and people of color who remain conservative on the authority of scripture on the belief that Jesus is the only way to salvation and that the principalities and powers of this dark world are real, that there's, this is a spiritually charged place. Spiritual warfare exists. And so I don't want us, once again, please don't have my talk away point being like, we need less racial justice. We need to lead, lean less into these issues. That's not what I'm saying. I think that Carl Henry would warn us today not to deconstruct our orthodoxy in efforts to have a more socially engaged faith, for it is our commitment to biblical authority and truth that will lead to a more just and peaceful world. So let's expose the lie of expressive individualism that tempts progressive Christians and conservative Christians in similar ways and embrace the whole gospel for the whole world. Thanks. Uh, what a banquet of insight. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, fabulous. Um, I'm going to have you guys in conversation with each other. Just a quick uh, recap of some of the things you said about Scott, a positive public theology. I'd like to see a little bit more of that. Charles, your discussion about um, uh, when you're bringing in people uh, to help and whatever ministry, whatever is playing nice. Uh, how are we behaving? What, what's the character? What's being exhibited? It makes me think of what Paul McNulty said. Paul used the expression breathtaking decline of kindness uh, in, in society. And then Aaron, uh, friend, um, your deep concern about the church really being co-opted uh, by the culture in its attempt to um, achieve a more just society, losing the biblical foundation. Just powerful, powerful Thoughts. So, gentlemen, let me give you an opportunity to, to interact with each other, pose questions to each other. You have the floor. Can I, could you say a little bit more about the affordable housing work yeah. and what and why? Yeah. So, um, D.C. owns more vacant land than um, any other group in D.C. other than the federal, uh, other than the government, and many of these churches are becoming sold to condo developers and others. Um, affordable housing was one of the most urgent issues um, in our city. Um, many people are being displaced because of gentrification in the city and the high cost. And so, um, so the call, it really the call for that really came from members of our own church, particularly people who are not upwardly mobile in our church who are being displaced from Columbia Heights, which was like the fastest gentrifying neighborhood in DC. And um, what we found was that many churches have, uh, while they have the asset of land, the complexity of navigating how to build affordable housing, it's very expensive and you can really be taken advantage of by developers and other things. So what we did was create a process and educating to help walk with churches. And then I think one of the unique contributions is helping disciple people. Like tonight we're doing a Housing 101 workshop for churches all throughout the city to help educate people on the biblical call to this. Because I think a lot of people come at these issues where they learned it in school and other things and there's this kind of, this is the right thing to do. But there's not necessarily understanding the biblical call to this work. And so that's sort of some of the work that, that we've tried to do with that. That's excellent. You, We've talked about the Shema a little bit here, and, and one of the things I want to kind of add as an aside to that, and then I'll talk a little bit about this kind of notion of positive, a positive development of public theology. You know, usually the trajectory in the Bible is in the Old Testament, you're dealing with corporate realities, you move to the New Testament, now you're dealing with individual faith, individual realities. Um, interestingly, with this call to wholeness that we find in Deuteronomy 6, 
it's, it's notably individual in Deuteronomy 6. Mo Moses even tells us, therefore, talk about it with your family members. Talk about it when you're on the road. Put it on your hands and on your, your front list. Put it on your, your doors and your gates, right? Um, it's all very individual application of the wholeness that we're called to. What's interesting about this is that you move into the New Testament, and now this, this kind of this creed is echoing in the backs of everyone's minds. And even Christ, as he's about to go be betrayed in John 17, he's singing his high priestly prayer. Go back and read the end of the high priestly prayer. He suddenly switches over and he says, Father, I pray that they would be one just as you and I are one. They in me just as I am in you so that the world will know that you loved me and you love them, right? Um, New Testament scholar Richard Bauckham rightly, I think, points out that Jesus is exegeting Deuteronomy 6 in a prayer form, but he's applying it corporately. He's saying you need to be one, not just as an individual who's, who's made whole, who's integrated, but you need to be made one as a community. You share the same lordship, the same spiritual DNA of the Holy Spirit testifying to your spirit of the lordship of Christ. There's a reason why we all ought to weep and our hearts are, ought to be rended when we see the lack of hospitality and fragmentation in the Christian witness in the world. And it's something that we all need to have a deep sense. Even if you say, well, what, I didn't have a chance this week to, do, to show hospitality. Well, how is it my fault, right? Even if you feel that way, even if, you're, even if we're, say, we're talking about the perception, the sense of an, a lack of hospitality be, ought to be something that is a driving um, force and impulse in the Christian church to be united as one under the lordship of Christ. And we see that as Jesus is about to be betrayed, that's the thing that's on his mind too, right? And he's praying on your behalf about that. And so, you know, Charles, as you're talking about your experience and, and, the, and the importance of being welcomed, you know, I'm thinking that should be, as we're developing a positive public theology, let me segue to that part of it, that should be one of those driving forces that we have to recognize as a church we are called to by our Lord and Savior, okay? What I mean by a positive move to um, what I mean is instead of sitting back and waiting to see what issues are thrown to us by the you know whatever the world around us and we're all a part of this world so I'm not making a hard distinction between us and the culture we're all a part of it we're all influencing it too but instead of waiting for those issues to be handed to us that we start developing a kind of magisterium on these issues. So we start developing what are, the, what are their authorized range of views? And what I mean by authorized, I mean by authorized by scripture. I'm talking about what is scripture, what, what, what directions does scripture send us on how we ought to think about humanity or dealing with poverty issues that involve both the spiritual and the physical? What, what ought we be thinking about as we're thinking through these issues so that when an issue arises on the, you know, on the horizon, we don't have to suddenly scramble to come up with whatever, whatever our talking points are. Um, Carl Henry talks about the importance of the gospel being understood socially and philosophically. And I'm talking here a little bit more about the, there's the social side of it, but the philosophical side of it too. Um, there's a book that just came out, Biblical Critical Theory by Chris Watkins. Some of you all may have seen it. He's an Australian philosopher who is interacting with philosophical readings of scripture. And he has this whole idea of that he calls diagonalization. And he says, as Christians, what we need to be doing is looking at those issues and those values that the world is presenting to us and recognizing that they are acknowledging, that these, these issues are acknowledging truths about the world, and yet recognizing that God's word on any given issue may or may not be aligned with the particular issues in front of us, whether that's individuality versus collective, collectivism, whether that's um, you know, material versus spiritual, all these different issues we might deal with. He says we need to diagonalize. We need to be able to look past the issues that are being handed to us and see what scripture, what, what, what God's world, what God's re revelation of himself tells us about these issues, and not settle on the arguments as they're framed by the media or by the, the discourse that's around key. us. I think that's a really important idea for us, so we can go in equipped. It's much more generative. We're not just reacting. Yeah. But now we're generating yeah. positive outlooks yes. on these issues. Yes. Aaron, you look, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to ask either of you, but maybe starting with Charles, what, um, one of the challenges, I think, is we're talking about Carl Henry and how to have a socially engaged, robust biblical engagement in public life. Um, one of the challenges 
you know, in this the social gospel evangelical kind of divide is that one group seems to emphasize personal sin and the other group seems to emphasize systemic or social sin, like group sin that exists in groups of people that gets manifest in policy. And I guess I would, I would kind of ask you, like, what, why do you think that exists? Like, why does that exist in America, this, like, just divide between these two? And what would, how would you challenge um, maybe the evangelical world to be, to have more of an understanding of, of systemic sin? And, and why, you know, how is it that we miss that so often? Terrific question. It's a great question. Um, and I, 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 I hear it in the wake of what you were saying about let them all be one, may they all be one. Because I, I think it's important for us to, to see uh, evangelicals and kind of those who've inherited social gospel as one, as the same church. You know, Reverend Barber um, prays to the same Jesus that Max Licato prays to. And I think, God willing, we'll all be together on the other side. And yet, I know there are people who, are, who read Max Licato, who listen to K-Love, who don't think Barber is a Christian, who don't think Shane Claiborne's a Christian. And there are people in Shane and, and Barber's camp who really don't think that folks on the far right of evangelicalism are Christian either. And that's tragic, you know? It's, it, and I don't think it's obeying this, this call to be one. You know? I, I, I think why are we missing each other? It's interesting, you were saying something about like um, liberal Christians, progressive Christians kind of being seduced by um, sort of secularism, that's sort of the world in the sense of... I, I think a part of the reason why I personally have been drawn, why I, I identify as a progressive Christian is because of a lack of care or articulated care around social issues. Mm -hmm. Most of my adult life, I went to event churches that would be described as evangelical churches. I don't think I ever would have called myself that. I kind of came up in like the black church, which is often kind of erased when we talk about evangelicalism, even if it's sort of very similar theologically. It's not who people think about. It's not who the media. But I sort of went to evangelical churches and had to leave because when Trayvon Martin got killed, and every single black church I knew had a million hoodies Sunday. And I showed up at the kind of white evangelical church with a hoodie on. No one else did. And the pastor didn't preach about it. We didn't talk about it in the prayer time, not in the coffee hour, ever. The next church I was at, when I began to sort of, Chaz, what did you do your, your dissertation on? Black liberation theology. How could you do that? That's not Christian. Mama, and, and James Cohn is this, and James like, all right, man. Like I, I don't feel welcome here, and you don't care about these issues. So it wasn't being sort of drawn in by something outside of the church. It was feeling like y'all just don't care. Mm -hmm. That sort of, and so how do we make it up? I don't think one needs to land with a conviction of what's wrong in the world, but like let's talk about it. Can we have an, an open conversation about it during our coffee hour? Can we, can, can we engage our students about it? You know, as opposed to reactionary kind of stuff. You know, I, I don't mean to ramble, but you know, conversations about critical race theory, for example, which there is no like elementary school that teaches that, there's no high school that teaches that, but it's this boogeyman that was, I literally teach critical race theory on the college level. The only time we've talked about race in some of the evangelical spaces I've been in are to sort of vilify critical race theory about how it's communist and it's making all our kids but like so so how do we bridge this divide let's have a conversation in love the same goes for the inverse though because the only conversations being had about evangelicals right now are about how terrible trump was in january 6th which also isn't fair and, and is probably even more unfair and so i think the same challenge to folks on on the left end of the christian spectrum needs to be given too because that's not fair either, and it's not accurate. Quite a challenge. That's quite a challenge because I wonder if there was more of that public conversation between church leaders, how that might actually affect the larger conversation when, when the world sees Christians who disagree, but seeing them behave really beautifully amongst themselves. That can challenge the conscience a little bit. 
uh, e even among some of our media elites, maybe for themselves to behave a little better and ratchet it down when they see men and women behaving in that very civil, loving way. I think we're out of time, guys. We've got to get to our three o'clock speak. But how about a round of applause okay. for this? <laughs> this Thank you, brother. Thank you. And I think Mark Tooley, you're doing the introductions. <laughs> Finally got him to do something. It's just ah. terrific. It's just wonderful. Got him, got him out of his chair. It's just great. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful day. Uh, we're about to move to our uh, concluding uh, epic of this uh, program, and our conference has been on the state of evangelical life, we're going to conclude with a Roman Catholic voice. Uh, it always comes back to Roman Catholicism, doesn't it? We can't do without the resources and the tradition and the riches that uh, Roman Catholicism brings to Christian thought. So we're very grateful to uh, Samuel Gregg, one of the more uh, prominent and uh, thoughtful uh, Catholic voices in public life in America to bring to us his uh, overview of what has been said uh, so far. I associate Sam with the, the Acton Institute, but he has since affiliated with another organization uh, that is free market oriented, whose name is too complicated for me to recall. So <laughs> maybe he can uh, share that uh, with us, but his wonderful writing uh, continues in either context. His respondent will be uh, uh, an old friend uh, to me and Joe Lacanti, uh, Sheree Harder, head of the uh, Trinity Forum. So looking forward to a fantastic conversation between the two of them. Sam Gregg, thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction. So I am distinguished, this is the title, Distinguished Fellow in Political Economy at the American Institute for Economic Research. <laughs> So I'll say something a little bit about that later, but let me preface everything by saying that my title is, is Faith, Reason, and the Christian in the Modern World, Lessons from Catholic Social Teaching. Uh, and I'm aware I'm the only Roman Catholic in the room, but I've heard words like philosophically understanding the scriptures. I heard the word magisterium as well. So I'm already feeling quite at home in many respects. <laughs> So thank you. Um, and I also want to stress that um, I spend most of my time thinking and writing about questions of political economy and economic policy. But today I'm going to be uh, talking about this question from the perspective of someone who considers himself a sort of run-of-the-mill, small-o, orthodox Roman Catholic who adheres to the church's teaching on faith and morals without exception. So that's the perspective I'm coming from. So this is not a perspective from America magazine. This is not the perspective of an integralist who wants Pope Francis to rule the world or something like that. <clears throat> I think it's actually the perspective of someone who's, uh, as I said, a small o orthodox Roman Catholic. So I do spend most of my time in the world of scholarly world of economics and economic policy. And it's very rare these days that I get the opportunity to venture into the realms of philosophy and theology. But at different points of my life, I have engaged in these areas with regard to two topics. One is natural law theory. The second is the relationship between reason and faith in the context of a post-enlightenment world. And in the context of some of the debates around this topic in the world of Roman Catholicism. Now, I first read Carl Henry's book, The Uneasy Conscience, about 20 years ago, and I'm certainly no expert on Henry or his work. But I do remember his book's critique of liberal theology, his emphasis upon grounding doctrine upon the scriptures, his rejection of the position articulated by the fundamentalists of his time, and his book's focus on Christians engaging in the modern world. And this paralleled, of course, in many ways, some of the issues that would be addressed about 15 years later in the Catholic world uh, during the Second Vatican Council. Now, in his book, Henry argued, quote, that evangelical Christianity has become increasingly inarticulate about the social reference of the gospel. 
Well, since 1891, um, the Catholic Church has primarily engaged in that question, in the social question, in the social implications of the Christian gospel, through the medium of what's called modern Catholic social teaching, which begins in 1891 with Leo XIII's Rerum Novarum. Now, in my short remarks today, I'm going to propose to you a thesis about Catholic social teaching that might help some of our broader reflections about the Christian in the modern world today. And you'll, as you go on, as I go on, you'll hear it picks up on some of the things that I've heard mentioned today by different speakers. And it's a thesis, I'm afraid, that may be a little bit provocative. My thesis is going to be this, that in its present form, modern, much of modern Catholic social teaching is an exhausted project. More specifically, I think Catholic social doctrine is presently handicapped by several problems that are undermining the church's capacity to articulate a social teaching that is clear, that actually helps lay Christians in the world, and above all, is distinctly Christian. And I also am going to suggest that, that uh, at least for Catholics, Catholics need to consider radical change in what the church says about social and economic questions and radical change in the resources upon which the church draws as it develops its social teaching. And when I say radical, I don't mean conformity to the present. I mean going in the most radical way, which is going back to the sources of Christian revelation. That's the most the radics of the faith is there. And that's what I think the church should be doing. Now, when I say I think that a lot of Catholic social teaching is an exhausted project, I don't mean that the church should not have a social teaching, let alone engage with questions ranging from the sanctity of human life to questions of liberty and justice in the society, in the economy, racism, all these things. Because as Carl Henry understood, the Christian gospel has always had implications for the social and economic order. I also don't mean that the principles of Catholic social teaching are somehow wrong or inadequate. In fact, I think the principles, principles like the dignity of the human person, the principle of solidarity, the principle of subsidiarity, these principles are universal and always binding, after all, because these principles are derived directly from divine revelation. And I would add natural law. But the trans transformative power, I think, of these truths I want to suggest, is presently limited by several pro problematic features of modern Catholic social teaching, problems that I think in many ways are widespread in the Christian church as a whole, and I've heard some of them already mentioned today. So here are four such problems. One, first, much modern Catholic social teaching, I think, is insufficiently attentive to the evidence offered by the modern social sciences. I think one e example of this is the general reluctance of the church's social teaching to acknowledge that the last 35 years have witnessed the greatest and fastest reductions in poverty across the globe. Now, to be sure, this reduction in poverty, as well as measurable increases in things like lifespans, health and nutrition levels, it hasn't happened everywhere or at the same rate. But if you read the documents of Catholic social teaching, you would not know, for example, that China, India, most of Southeast Asia, and even parts of Latin America have reduced poverty in dramatic and lasting ways. You won't find many references to this. Nor is there any reference in Catholic social teaching to the fact that these positive changes strongly correlate with open markets, private enterprise, and commerce. So put another way, Catholic social teaching, which is rightly and indispensably concerned with material poverty, rarely asks why. Why some countries have reduced poverty and why some other countries, countries virtually identical in resources, geography, population size, language, have not reduced poverty. A second problem with modern Catholic social teaching, I would suggest that it is presently trying to speak about too many things. So to put this in perspective, the English language length of Leo XIII's Rerum Novarum is 14,000 words. 
By comparison, the length of John Paul II's Centesimus Annos is 27,000 words. The length of Benedict XVI's Caritas in Veritate is 30,000 words. The length of Pope Francis's Laudato Si is 40,000 words. Now, it could be argued that this growth reflects the increasing complexity of social and economic life, but I also think that the growing length reflects the sheer number of topics about which what's called Catholics call the social magisterium is speaking. So examples of topics mentioned by Benedict XVI's Caritas and Veritate include energy efficiency, desertification, international tourism, cooperative purchasing, tax subsidies, and pawnbroking. In Laudato Si, examples of some of the topics mentioned include acidification of the oceans, circular models of production, paper recycling, public transport, levels of plankton in the ocean, <laughs> the disposal of detergents, the effects of synthetic agrotoxins, the replacement of virgin forest with plantations, genetically modified cereals, environmental renewal projects, and my personal favorite, the economic effects of air conditioning. <laughs> By the way, the Latin for air conditioning is air frigidere. I know that because that was the question everyone wanted to know when the Latin translate, how are they gonna use, what's gonna describe air conditioning? <laughs> <clears throat> now I could go on and mention more subjects from other encyclicals. Now all these subjects, to varying degrees are of course worth discussing. But it's not clear to me why Catholic social teaching should be commenting on the details of these topics. What can the Catholic Church really say, for example, about the science of air conditioning or the economics of tax subsidies that can't already be said by a secular-minded scientist or a secular-minded economist? But I also think that pronouncing at length on these and many other topics has two negative effects. One, I think, is that it confuses Christians. Catholic social teaching states over and over and over again that it offers no concrete solutions to particular problems. But over and over and over again, <clears throat> the documents of Catholic social teaching do propose quite concrete solutions to many political and economic problems. These have ranged from Pius XI's Quadragesimo Anno, which called for the establishment of corporate bodies charged with particular economic responsibilities, otherwise known as corporatism, which is a whole political and economic system, to Paul VI's Populum Progressio, proposing the establishment of a world fund to help developing nations, to Caritas and Veritate, proposing an expansion of microfinance. So these are, in fact, concrete solutions that the Magisterium also says it's not proposing. A third problem <clears throat> is that when I think Catholic social teaching makes proposals for action, it frankly intrudes, in many cases, on the rightful freedom of Christian laity. So let me explain. In its decree on the laity, the Second Vatican Council specifies that the church's, quote, ministry of the word and the sacraments is, quote, entrusted in a special way to the clergy, end quote. It then states that, quote, the laity must take up the renewal of the temporal order, this world, as their, their own special obligation. They must, the council stated, act directly and in a definitive way in the temporal sphere, end quote. So there is, I think, to use an economic term, a clear division of labor that's spe specified here. Now, obviously, this division of labor is not absolute. The clergy, bishops, priests, nuns, religious, even popes, perfectly entitled to have and even express political and economic opinions. There are also many occasions when the church's pastors must speak directly, defending, for example, the liberties of the church is one such case. And obviously, I think the church's pastors must speak when a policy or a position directly violates the moral order. But when it comes to making positive proposals about how to do the good, there is usually, usually, 
a legitimate plurality of opinion that's permissible among Catholics. There's nothing in Catholic teaching that tells us that the state must control 25% of the economy or 26% of the economy or 30% of the economy. Faithful Catholics can legitimately disagree about such subjects. And where this type of legitimate disagreement is possible, which is most areas of public policy, I would suggest that Catholic social teaching should generally not outline policy proposals for doing the good. Why? Because this is, as Vatican II states, the responsibility of the laity. So put another way, part of the way function of Catholic social teaching, the way it functions at the moment, it leads to some of the worst types of clericalism on the part of Catholic clerics. But they get up and talk about things they don't know anything about and which they not, it's not their job to engage in discussions of. So let's move to the fourth and I think perhaps the most serious problem I think with contemporary Catholic social teaching I'd like to mention today and I foreshadowed this. It is this, that the documents of Catholic social teaching do not give enough attention to the distinctly Christian insights that are found in Revelation, in the scriptures, or for what Catholics consider important things like the Church Fathers. To give you a recent example, Jesus Christ, the Lord of history, is not mentioned in Pope Francis's Laudato Si until the 83rd paragraph of the encyclical. The 83rd paragraph. Now, Christians are supposed to take Christ seriously when he says he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we believe that the fullness of truth is ultimately found in the person of Jesus Christ. So why does a Catholic social encyclical wait until its 83rd paragraph to mention the name of Jesus Christ? Likewise, if you look at all the social encyclicals, references to the church fathers is very limited. Only eight out of 172 references in Laudato Si are to the Church Fathers. Only one out of 166 references in Centesimus Annos are to the Church Fathers. Now, I think the Church Fathers are some of the greatest Christian minds to walk the earth. Some of them were very close to the apostolic generation, people like Ignatius of Antioch. They knew these people. They were also deeply familiar with the world and they wrote extensively on economic, social and political subjects. So why do they receive such limited attention? So these are some of the reasons I think that the present trajectory of Catholic social doctrine is frankly rendering it unhelpful to Christians. Now, I want to restate something. None of what I've said means that the moral principles which are the foundation of Catholic social teaching, are somehow problematic. These deepest, the deepest roots of these principles lie in divine revelation, and Catholics would add, in the writings of the fathers and doctors of the church, the lives of the saints, the church's magisterial teaching, and the natural law. Rather, I am concerned that Catholic social teaching presently muddles the teaching of doctrine with extensive commentary on facts and probabilities that are contingent, variable, and up for legitimate debate among Catholics. A second problem, I think, that which flows from this is a downplaying of the room for legitimate disagreement among lay Catholics about most such questions. Now, I want to stress, this is not a phenomena peculiar to Pope Francis's social teaching. Other papal encyclicals contain reflections on subjects about which neither popes nor bishops have any particular expertise or authority, qua pope or qua bishop, to speak. John Paul II's Solicitudo Re Socialis, 1987, for instance, contains an analysis of Cold War geopolitics that discusses and offers judgments about social trends, historical circumstances, contingent facts and matters of technique which don't fall within the remit, remit of the deposit of faith that popes and Catholic bishops have the mandate to pass on to their successors and proclaim and defend to the world. 
So the problem here, I think, is what I would call Episcopal clerical overreach. For Catholics, anything that falls within the sphere of faith and morals is most certainly the business of bishops. But many things, like physics, mathematics, the technical aspects of monetary policy, the science of the weather, the origins of the First World War, the color I choose to paint a wall, these are not faith and moral <laughs> questions. Thus, it's unclear to me why popes and Catholic bishops address these types of questions in their capacity as authoritative teachers of Catholic faith. So as a minimum, Catholic bishops, I think, should ensure that everyone understands that when they're commenting on, say, the economics of urban design, they're doing so in a personal capacity as John Smith, everyday citizen, rather than Cardinal Joseph Smith, Archbishop of Smallville and successor of the Apostles. Now, some bishops <clears throat> and bishops' conferences, like the American Catholic bishops in the 1980s and early 1990s, who address these topics, often gloss over and even omit these rather important qualifications. Now, I'm going to sound uncharitable now, but I think this might be partly because Absent their clerical office and the status which gives them, that this gives them in society, no one, including Catholics, has any particular reason to concern themselves with bishops' thoughts about these subjects. But even when a question, a social question, does enter questions of faith and morals, I think Catholic social teaching needs to specify the differences in the way that the positive and negative norms of Christian moral teaching apply. So in very simple terms, the negative precepts of Christian moral teaching, which are summed up, I think, in the Decalogue Second Tablet, which were reconfirmed by Christ himself as a condition for entry into eternal life, Matthew 19, 16 to 19, and reiterated by St. Paul, Romans 13, 8 to 10. These negative precepts bind absolutely. There is never a good or proportionate reason to murder or to steal. No amount of known and unknown consequences, circumstances, or proportionate reasons can justify a choice to do evil. As John Paul II once wrote, quote, the whole tradition of the church has lived and lives on the conviction that, quote, there are acts which per se and in themselves, independently of circumstances, are always seriously wrong by reason of their object. These negative commandments are, as Thomas Aquinas observed in his commentary on Paul's epistle to the Romans, always binding in every situation. Semper ad et semper. Now, an example of such an exceptionalist norm is the act whose intended object is precisely to kill a person. Even if such an act might save an entire city from destruction, the act's object remains intrinsically evil. It can therefore never be chosen. We may never, as Paul said, do, good, do evil that good may come of it. Now, the positive precepts of Christian moral teaching, especially as expressed in the Decalogue's first tablet, the Beatitudes, the great commandment to love God and neighbor, these are also obviously binding. But yet, as Aquinas notes, these often apply variously. And acknowledging this variability involves no denial of the objectivity, universality, and absoluteness of the precepts stated by Christian ethics. So for example, we are commanded to honor our father and mother. But how we give effect to this commandment depends upon a range of contingent factors, like our age and their age, whether our parents are alive or dead. It really makes a difference. Or take Christ's commandment to love the poor. That Christians must care for the poor is certainly not in question. It's a non-negotiable part of the faith. But once, however, we consider how Christians give effect to this positive commandment to love and serve the poor through politics or economic policy, there is considerable room for reasonable disagreement among Christians. So, <clears throat> in other words, 
while we may never choose evil, it is often possible to identify different options, all of which conform to principles of revelation and natural law, even if some of these options are incompatible with each other, insofar as they embody different risks, strengths, weaknesses, and incommensurable benefits and disadvantages. So on most, though not all, most policy issues, the choice for Christians is not between only good and bad options, but also sometimes many good options, which, uh, to cite the late natural law philosopher Germain Grise, may be incompatible with one another, but nonetheless compatible with church teaching. So, <clears throat> to give you an example, the answer of how a modern society realises something like universal health care for all its citizens depends partly upon assessments of scientific, empirical and economic information which are reasonably in dispute, not just among specialists, but also people well informed by Christian faith. So having surveyed the available evidence, assessed the contingent factors, considered the different trade-offs and side effects, and then applied principles of Christian ethics, some Christians may determine that universal health care is best realized by a predominantly state-funded health care system that prohibits particular practices like euthanasia. Other Christians, having gone through the same process of reflection, may determine that private health insurance, with the state providing a minimum safety let and prohibiting the same types of evil practices, is the most reasonable approach. So that's a very good example of how Christians can reasonably disagree with each other about an important policy question with no one being able to say, well, you're not a good Christian because you're in favour of a private approach or you're not a good Christian because you want to, you want to um, collectivise the entire healthcare system. These are very important distinctions. So <clears throat> how might some of the problems I'm suggesting with modern Catholic social teaching be resolved? So in a way, I think the difficulties indicate the answers. So here are three suggestions. First, <clears throat> popes and bishops should avoid promulgating social teaching documents that contain long reflections on historical circumstances, contingent facts, and matters of technique, because these subjects fall outside the scope of faith and morals, and bishops have no special competence as bishops to address these topics. It's one thing to teach the principles that Christians should bring to bear upon, for example, environmental stewardship or international relations or economic policy. That's fine. It's another matter, however, to ruminate about air conditioning's probable effects on climate change, to discuss the economic implications of signing particular treaties, or ponder the likelihood of minimum wage hikes, raising living standards, or pricing people out of labour markets. Second, I think popes and bishops should focus on stating and explaining the principles of Christian social teaching as part of their responsibility to form, in this case, Catholics in all the truths of Catholic faith. And as a corollary of that, I think they should stress that the primary responsibility for applying these principles to the temporal order belongs, as Vatican II stated, to the laity as, quote, their own special obligation. Now, certainly, I think bishops should point out when a policy directly violates the exceptionalist norms of the church's moral teaching. So, for example, if a state health care policy actively promoted eugenics, it would be incumbent, I believe, upon the local bishop to state that this aspect of the policy is morally evil and that no Catholic hospital will engage in such practices. That, however, is very different from a bishop's conference presenting an entire policy proposal to Congress for, say, immigration reform or revising the United States-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. In other words, while bishops should state the principles of the church's teaching, it's not their responsibility to put forward programs for action. Third, I think popes and bishops should specify 
the Catholic social teaching is inseparable from Catholic moral teaching and that a crucial part of that moral teaching concerns the distinction between the applicability of what I call the negative moral norms and the positive moral norms. Now, I think that giving effect to these suggestions would inject much needed stability and coherence into Catholic social teaching, which is not obvious right now, and clarify the respective responsibilities of bishops and lay Catholics. Alas, I presently see little indication of any willingness at present on Rome's part to do so, nor do I detect any acknowledgement that the problems I've detailed above are real and they contribute significantly to the Catholic Church's reduction in many people's minds to the status of just another lobby group among thousands of other lobby groups whose concerns are to be humoured, manipulated, mocked, or even simply ignored. Now, many bishops, I suspect, in fact I know, would welcome these and similar suggestions, not least, I think, because it would help to force some of their confreres in the episcopate to clarify what they believe is more important. Is it to be known as a political player and consummate schmoozer a la the likes of the former Cardinal Archbishop of this city, Theodore McCarrick, in cities like Washington DC and events like the World Economic Forum? Is it to attend conferences in China and then proclaim as the former president of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences did, quote, those who are best implementing the social doctrine of the church are the Chinese. He said it. And continually talk about subjects that one plainly knows little about. Or is the responsibility to focus on their actual responsibility to form Christians in the truths of the Christian faith, including all those presently unfashionable hard truths that Christ taught without ambiguity? Is it to preach the gospel in its fullness, a gospel that clearly states that there are no utopias in this world and that the completeness of the kingdom of God will only be realised in the world which is to come? Now, I think the fact that such questions even have to be posed today tells us something about the lamentable state in which much of the Catholic Church presently finds itself. Very similar questions, I think, confront the Christian Church more widely. As Christians discern how to live out the, the Lord's commandment to love our neighbour in ways that are heedful of the genuine achievements of modernity, that recognize the importance of bringing the specific insights of revelation upon the problems that Christians confront, and that understand the room for legitimate disagreement when it comes to how we address most of these problems. Christians, I think, must certainly be as bold as Carl Henry urged when engaging the gospel with the world. It cannot be indifferent to the world. But the boldness for which Henry called, I think, must be guided by the truths of faith and the truths of reason. And that, I'd suggest, is the challenge facing all Christians wanting to shape the modern world today more in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Well, we have a respondent, Cherie Harder. So, uh, Sam, we'll welcome you, perhaps, uh, right uh, up front. And Cherie, you're going to use the uh, podium? Yeah. Um, Sam, thank you for that critique, which I just found riveting, absolutely riveting. Uh, I, uh, the discussion you had about uh, bishops and others speaking about matters which they don't really know that much about, I can think of just a kind of summary phrase, just a few words, stay in your lane, Mr. Bishop, right? Stay in your lane. So, brilliant. Thank you, Joe. You, you, you stole my line there. Um, so, Sam, thank you so much for such a thoughtful um, uh, speech, and thank you to all of you for enduring until the very end. I know I am the last one between 
you and sweet freedom, so I will try to make this you know, relatively quick. Um, Sam, I so appreciated your, your thoughts. I actually grew up in a somewhat fundy background, uh, found myself rolling off a mountain and founding my, finding myself at Harvard and having to kind of think through at that point uh, faith reason um, and revelation. Uh, in the last several years, I have led a think tank uh, or a Christian think tank in, in DC called the Trinity Forum, where we try to cultivate, curate, and disseminate the best of Christian thought leadership. So many of the questions that you've raised are, are really quite germane. And as you were talking, one of the things that occurred to me, of course, is while you're talking from a Catholic perspective, a lot of the very uh, critiques you raised certainly affect evangelicals as well. Um, we too often you know, hear different talks, uh, hear doctrine promulgated, which perhaps does not pay a lot of attention to current social science. We definitely hear clergy speaking to things far beyond their base of authority or expertise. Uh, I, I vividly recall at one point sitting in my grandmother's church, a fundy church in the Midwest, and hearing the minister talk at great length about how equestrians were all pansies. Um, you know, <laughs> presumably a bit out, outside of the lane. Um, there are times we don't sufficiently ground our arguments in scripture. Um, all of that, I think, is absolutely true, and even though the pronouncements of a misguided, fundy preacher in the Midwest don't carry the same ecclesial authority as some of the, the published Catholic teaching, it's still something that we, that we contend with, people essentially abusing the authority, a widespread phenomenon of people who are experts in one area, thinking that their brilliance must therefore be scattered liberally across all sorts of uh, different categories uh, and topics. Uh, and that certainly happens within the evangelical world as well. But I also wanted to offer an additional thought, that perhaps one of the main problems with our thinking as evangelicals isn't just our thinking, uh, that perhaps a lot of the distortions of our thinking are actually the result of disordered loves. Uh, you mentioned the determinatio, Aquinas' term, for you know, essentially the, uh, the believer's freedom to kind of delve more deeply into what scripture actually says and, and work that out, uh, make those determinations uh, in the freedom of Christ. And I'll throw out another Latin term, which I very rarely do, which comes from Augustine, which is the libido dominandi. That is the desire and lust for domination. And I think it's that lust for domination that actually explains a lot of the disorder and distortion in our thinking. Now what do I mean by that? I'll uh, throw out a bunch of ideas where I think this actually uh, re re is reflected in a lot of our public discourse uh, and in a lot of our public square. Evangelicals certainly don't comprise the entirety of the public square. And from what I have heard, there were a lot of very helpful and necessary caveats given last night, just about the term itself, uh, the fact that this has often become a tribal and political term rather than a creedal term. Uh, there's a lot of debate about what actually makes an evangelical. Uh, increasingly, it seems like in many polls, evangelicals are simply defined by, I'm white, I like Trump, and God's great too. Uh, that's obviously not the substance of what that means, and so I want to throw all those caveats out there right at the beginning. And yet, we, all of us who are Christians, are called to be known as people of love. But we are in the midst of a civic crisis of loathing, fear, contempt, and confusion that we have participated in, failed to stop, and failed to model and embody a different way. There's all sorts of ways this is reflected. At this point, some polls, some surveys, more than 40% of Americans reportedly view their opponents not only as stupid, but as evil. Nearly 20% of Americans are partisans on each side of the aisle admit to, quote, thinking on occasion that the country would be better off if large numbers of the opposition died. In one Washington Post, University of Maryland poll released showed that nearly a third of those polled believe that violence against the government can sometimes be justified. And an AEI study, a conservative group, found that white evangelicals stood apart from other religious groups when asked about the potential for violent action, 41% 
agreed that, quote, if elected leaders will not protect America, the people themselves must do it, even if it require taking violent actions. In addition to our anger, um, we are also deeply confused. And sadly, it's not just because the clergy have overstepped uh, or been confusing or even hypocritical in their remarks. That same AEI survey found that 27% of white evangelicals, the most of any religious group, believe in parts or all of the widely debunked Q conspiracy theory. And misinformation campaigns online often specifically targeted evangelicals because they were fertile grounds for doing so. In addition to our confusion and our anger, one of the things that one sees is that increasingly politics has become an ever deeper part of our identity. That's true across the board, but it's also true for evangelicals uh, and Christians who should know better at the most deep level that that's not the case. One example of that, for most of our country's history, as long as they've been doing polls, it was far more likely to marry someone outside of your party than to marry someone outside of your faith. Within the last seven or eight years, that has flipped. It is now far more likely for people to marry outside of their faith convictions than outside of their party. Uh, there has uh, been other sociological evidence that has suggested that for most of our time as a country, religion was called an unmoved mover of identity. It was one of those core forms of identity that helped shape and form others. That is largely becoming replaced by partisanship as one of the unmoved movers of identity. That's also uh, not only reflected, but also furthered by the way we get our information. Increasingly, not only are our identities increasingly political, we are looking for our sense of reality and truth from information streams that are personalized, politicized, and often weaponized. Time on task has historically been one of the most important educational standards of what we learn. Uh, and unfortunately, there's very little difference in terms of the time that evangelicals spend on social media versus the population as a whole. And if time on task is a great indicator of what we learn and how our thinking is formed, uh, it's no surprise that a lot of not just what we think and the information we take in, but how we think about things is essentially being formed by social media streams, which again are often targeted to both to hook our attention and to keep it with uh, examples of nut picking, basically showing us the worst possible examples of people that we disagree with, uh, as well as validations of our own biases. But I'll also suggest that one of the most unsettling ways that this also plays out is through a growing sense of purpose that we the people seem to get from political combat. Uh, Increasingly, there's a sense, certainly online, but other, other places as well, that um, there are great battles that are divided along Manichaean lines, that mercy or grace to the enemy is a sign of capitulation or weakness, that decency and kindness uh, have, by some, it's been explicitly called second order virtues that should take second place to pursuing whatever the political aim is. Uh, and then in many ways, this has helped shape people's sense uh, of a purpose and worth and, and sense of meaning, uh, which of course is not where we should be getting our sense of meaning from. Another area that this libido dominandi, the desire to dominate, I think plays out in the, is in the act of suppression of voices we don't like or don't want to hear from. Um, one of the things that I will say, just to be deliberately provocative to this group, there are a lot of churches who seem to go out of their way to make sure the women in their congregation are quiet, don't have access uh, to either leadership roles, aren't heard. If we evangelicals are going to have a robust voice or a healthy role in the public square, half of our number cannot be suppressed. With that, I think there are many opportunities that attend our moment. Several of them have already been discussed. I don't want to play into the role of everything has been said, but not everyone has said it, but there's a few I feel like need to be mentioned. 
One, uh, it's been said by several people, we need to develop a robust public as well as political theology. It's one of the many reasons why this gathering today is so valuable. I want to just thank Joe and Mark for hosting it. A second opportunity is we are at a point where the felt need for the gospel is acute. Uh, we are at a time of deep loneliness, atomization, alienation, fragmentation, so many terms that have, trends have, that have been discussed today. And of course, we worship a God who tells us that he will never leave us and never forsake us, that he comes to make all things new, that he comes to put the lonely in families. We have good news to share with a lonely, fragmented, hurting world. And it's an incredible opportunity that needs that are there are now felt much more acutely and that we have some wonderful news to share. A third opportunity I think we have, which has also been mentioned, is that of hospitality. Uh, it's uncanny how often the Bible not only talks about hospitality, commands hospitality. I think historically hospitality has been one of those virtues that has been often overlooked, not given nearly as much shrift, largely because it has been largely relegated to the realm of the feminine. But hospitality is so important, and it's while it's not the key to overcoming all of what we face, I think no robust public theology will be complete without it. A fourth opportunity I think we have is to look at the ways and the means um, that we employ in our, in our public actions, in our public uh, discourse, as well as the ends. Uh, this is also something that has been talked about. Uh, several people just mentioned the cruelty, the unkindness that has attended uh, a lot of our public discourse and a lot of our public actions. Uh, it is certainly true that Christianity is far more than adverbial, but it's also not less than that. Uh, decency, kindness, grace are not second level virtues. Uh, we are commanded constantly to love our neighbors, to love even our enemies. And the way in which we conduct ourselves in the public square at a time when it is so overwhelmingly angry, cruel, vicious, venomous, and deeply confused can be in and of itself not a witness and an embodiment of a different way. Finally and relatedly, we have an extraordinary opportunity to model the ways of Jesus. Um, Jesus not only talked, expressed propositional truth, he embodied all of those things. And when he invited people to be disciples, that meant following him, living the way he lived, adapting themselves to his, his patterns, his habits, his speeds. Uh, we are invited to do the same. And one of the things that is uncanny about so many of the ways that we have gone so wildly astray in terms of our public witness and actions is when we have departed from the way, supposedly in defense of the truth. Jesus' way were always embodied, personal, often inquisitive, curious, and held space for freedom and persuasion. And I think we have a real opportunity at a time when our discourse is characterized by viciousness, cruelty, often deliberate misunderstanding, and even an inculcation of confusion to embody a way that is very different and that models the way that, that uh, he who we worship actually live. It's that difference of modeling his way rather than trying to impose our way that I think is one of the key ways out of the libido dominandi that has afflicted not only our public actions and our public witness, but also deeply distorted our thinking. Thank you. Well, this was certainly worth waiting for, wasn't it, ladies and gentlemen? So impressive and so challenging and inspiring. Uh, uh, Cherie, uh, in the end of your remarks, sorry, the image that came into my mind about modeling his way is the, the story in the Gospels of the woman who's just called the sinful woman who comes into the house of Simon. And we're told that she just, she's just weeping. <laughs> she comes up behind Jesus and she's weeping with regret 
but also with the sense that this is the one person, the one man who will understand and forgive, which of course is exactly what Jesus does. I thought of that, so impressive. Uh, I want you guys to be in conversation with each other. We do have just about 10 minutes left. So if you think about asking questions, start queuing up right now. Um, I also thought, Sam, as you were talking, there's a line from um, uh, Walter Lippmann, who was a journalist in the 1920s and 30s, public intellectual, more on the, on the liberal side, but morally grounded in a lot of ways. I don't, I don't think he would have called himself an orthodox believer. But Lippmann was lamenting in the 1920s what was happening to American culture and Western culture after the First World War and the, a kind of a rejection of the biblical understanding of life and these new ideologies that were springing up becoming a, a substitute for Christianity, fascism, communism, eugenics, etc. And he's lamenting that, and I, I think I've got the quote right from, from memory from his book, Preface to Morals. We have succeeded only in substituting trivial illusions for, for majestic faith. That's from a person who didn't consider himself a Christian. Trivial illusions instead of the majestic faith that we once had. So with, that, with that, those thoughts in mind, let me allow you guys to have a bit of a conversation before we turn it over to, to the audience. Questions you want to ask each other? <laughs> well. You know, I guess one question I'll ask you as a Catholic observer of what's happening within evangelicalism, do you see uh, some of the challenges we face as fundamentally different from that within Catholicism or, uh, or, virtual, or much more similar? Uh, <clears throat> this one? Uh, yes, I think the challenges are in fact very, very similar. So the substitution of faith with politics, I, I see that everywhere in the Catholic world, not just in the United States but around the world. That's, mm. that's a very deep problem. because, And also the subordination of one's faith to one's political identity. You don't have to look very far in this city to find examples of that in the, the Catholic world at all, <laughs> right at the top. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one problem, which I think is very widespread in the, the Catholic world. Uh, I do think there's often a, in the Catholic world, there's certainly a sense that somehow we're all supposed to be on the same page when it comes to issues that are actually prudential. We don't actually need to be on the same page. I often say to people, you know, for, for Roman Catholics, it's a very small number of what you might call social political issues where you really are supposed to be on the same page because they concern such fundamental matters of um, revealed faith, revealed moral teaching, etc. And there isn't really a, um, you're, not at, you're not at liberty to just get up and say, well, that's it, I'm not interested or I dissent from this or whatever. But that's not most questions. And I find in a lot of Catholics and politics, they, they do things like they selectively quote from encyclicals and, and others can turn up and say, well, yes, but I found another quotation that proves the exact opposite. So that sort of selective um, uh, drawing upon authoritative sources to somehow claim that your healthcare policy is in fact what the church wants rather than your healthcare policy. When the, <laughs> the really, as I said, these matters are very much up, up for legitimate uh, disagreement. Um, I heard a number of references to the historic faith as well, and this is a broader problem which um, goes beyond some of the parameters of what we're talking about today. But there's no doubt in my mind that a lot of Catholic biblical scholarship has done a lot of damage to people's understanding of the realness, the historical events of what actually happened in the life, uh, the, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem because if you think that everything that happened in the life, uh, death, and resurrection of Christ I, either isn't quite real or it's a sort of projections of a community 50 years later projecting back their ideas about the gentle rabbi who was killed and then, and then the, the resurrection is this type of spiritual experience rather than the actual real thing, then that destroys the essence, I think, of Christian faith. Because if... If, as Paul says, Christ didn't actually rise from the dead, then our faith is worthless. It means nothing. And yet, there's plenty of Catholic biblical scholars, I think, who have done a lot of damage mm. to this since Vatican II, despite Vatican II making it very, very clear that the scriptures, the canon, is to be received and understood. Mm. The 
Christian Gospels as real live events involving real live people. That's been devastating, I think, mm -hmm. for belief. Now, I don't know how prevalent that is in the evangelical world, although I've heard people say, make some references to this weakening of a sense of the historical character of mm -hmm. the Christian faith, because I think what that leads to is it leads to faith gen degenerating into ideology. Yes. And that's always a problem, yes. because faith is not, Christian faith is not ideology. And I, I see that in parts of the Catholic world, and I worry about that happening in the broad general church mm. as a whole. Mm. Um, so there, I, there's lots of other things I could say, but mm. that's some general things which wow. I see reflected in both the Catholic and the evangelical wow. worlds. Fascinating, Sam, that you've once again, and it's happened more than once during our time together, bringing us back to the fundamentals of the faith, mm. the, the fundamental truths of the gospel, which, of course, is always a foundation for any kind of renewal cultural spiritual renewal. We do have a question from our studio audience. Yes, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the question of the, uh, or the, the point about in, uh, insisting on the historical reality of the claims of Christianity. Uh, and it ties directly to Carl Henry. I'll just make this, I gotta tell this anecdote and then I'll get to my question. But when uh, in the 1960s, the great uh, neo-Orthodox theologian, um, whose name's escaping me right now, uh, Bart, comes to Washington, D.C. Carl Bart comes to D.C. and he's giving a lecture at George Washington University. And Carl Henry shows up, you know, and he's reporting for Christianity Today. And many of you probably know this story, but he famously asks Carl Bart the question and says, uh, if, uh, if, if you were living in the first century, would you have experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a historical event in the sense that a news reporter would record a historical event? And Karl Barth famously responded, did you say you were from Christianity today or Christianity yesterday? And of course, <laughs> everyone applauded. And, and, uh, but Carl Henry, he didn't miss a beat. And he said, Christianity yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> and of course, you get there the divide between a lack of clarity about the historical reality of the resurrection uh, or that clarity. So I appreciate you making that point, And that is something we need to double down on. Um, my question is, I appreciated your nuance on the, uh, the importance of affirmative and negative precepts. I think that opens up just a lot of freedom, particularly in the itch issue of conscience, uh, so that pastors or the magisterium, in your case, aren't wrongly binding the consciences of their members um, and are actually able to bind it correctly. Because uh, oftentimes, as is the case today, it's not just that they're binding it on wrong issues. They're failing to bind it on the things they should be enforcing. Uh, and sometimes this comes down to issues of voting. This always comes up. So let me just ask you your thoughts on this. How do negative and affirmative precepts relate to when, if ever, uh, pastors, in the case of evangelicals or the magisterium, should give instructions in how people vote? Uh, well, in the 20th century, um, there were plenty of instances where Catholic prelates, bishops, po even popes, sort of gently hinted that if you were a serious practicing Catholic, your job was to vote for the German Christian Democratic Party or the Italian Christian Democratic Party, whichever was the party that claimed to be um, uh, representing the Christian presence in the public square. And there's a famous, and that you weren't supposed to stray outside that. And there was a famous um, cardinal, Cardinal Ottaviani, who was head of the Holy Office, otherwise known as once called the Inquisition, who made a, f a comment along the lines of, well, you can believe what you want about the, uh, the assumption, but if you vote for the Communist Party, your ex excommunication will arrive the next day. Right? Now, that's a sort of, I'm, I'm trivializing it, but there was an expectation on the part of, at different points in different countries, not so much in the United States, not so much in the Anglo-American world, but certainly in the continental European world, even to a certain extent in Latin America, where you had majority Roman Catholic populations. There was a tendency on the part of some Catholic clerics to sort of corral, quote unquote, the Catholic vote. And a lot of it was actually was driven, in the, in the case of Europe, a lot of it was driven by the need to put up firm opposition to communism. That was, so I understand why, but that has dropped off the, um, the sphere of, I think, possible options now. One, because Christianity is so weak in countries like Europe. Um, 
but also for more positive reasons in the sense that there's been a recognition that there's much more room for legitimate disagreement about where you line up on different political issues uh, in most countries, including in majority Catholic countries. Like I said, I mean, when I hear people, when I hear a, a, a priest or even a Catholic layperson saying something like, well, you know, this is what the tax rate should be, and you, if you disagree with that, then somehow you're not being faithful to the gospel. That's nonsense. That's literally nonsense. But, you know, I, I think the person who's written the best about this subject is, you probably won't be surprised to hear me say this, is um, one Joseph Ratzinger who wrote very, very clearly about the relationship between faith and politics, who made it very clear that there's lots of room for legitimate disagreement among Catholics and other Christians about most particular issues. But there are some issues which, um, because they go to the heart of questions of human dignity, they're not up for negotiation. So, for example, in the South during the period of um, the civil rights movement, the Catholic, I believe it was the Catholic Archbishop of New Orleans, excommunicated several Catholic politicians who basically said, no, no, segregation's fine, we're going to stick with this. And he was attacked, including by members of his own clergy, etc. But that's an example where it's very clear that um, a prelate has the job to say this is clearly not in accordance with church teaching, and you have a responsibility to think about that when it comes to your vote. Now, notice he doesn't say, you, and this is why you must vote Democrat or Republican or whatever. But you need to think that you need to understand that as carrying out your responsibility as a citizen, as a Christian in the public square, you need to think about this very, very seriously. But here's the other thing. I think the people who take these things seriously in the Catholic world are practicing Catholics. Right, so they're the ones who take, people like me, I guess. People who these are the ones who take these things seriously. When it comes to Catholics who are not practicing, they're all over the map politically. They're basically no different from the broad general distribution of how people we vote. Too. So, and I mean, I, I actually think it's generally healthy for whether it's evangelical pastors or Catholic bishops or priests, not to get into the business of talking about um, who you should and should not be voting for. I think generally they should just stay away from all that. It's much more important for them. Their job is to engage in formation, forming consciences, forming us in the principles of the gospel, and explaining to us that we have a responsibility to use our reason to apply these things in the public square which is, I think, what they should be doing. And a lot of them don't, I think, because in some cases, I hate to say this, but I think some Catholic prelates are actually bored with the gospel. So whenever I see a Catholic prelate who talks endlessly about cont contemporary political issues, endlessly, usually that's a very bad sign that there's a problem, that they're not taking the gospel seriously, wow. as seriously wow. as they should wow. be. Very sobering, very sobering, Sam. Cherie, any last comments? Because we're just about out of time. I want to give you an opportunity there. I'm good. I want to give Mark Tooley an opportunity to uh, express some thanks uh, to all of our participants, <laughs> <laughs> rousing him from his slumber uh, uh, there. Uh, a special word of thanks before I offer a word of thanks to our participants. You're doing thanks first, and I will follow you. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I want to thank everybody. This has been I, I, one of the most encouraging, challenging, stimulating, kind of hopeful conversations that I have been a part of literally for a number of years now. And I know for, for everyone here, it's a huge investment of time, sacrifice, you're stealing away time from other pressing obligations. Thank you, though, so much. Uh, uh, Mark and I are going to work to put this out in various forms, but certainly some kind of a book version of this, electronic, academic version, something to get it out into a wider, a wider dissemination. It just, I'm so grateful for you, and, and I come back to this, uh, what Sam was saying at the end here, really, a Christian anthropology is so important for us as we engage publicly. And I can't help but quote from J.R.R. Tolkien, a wonderful Catholic writer uh, from uh, the Lord of the Rings. I think it's Elrond who says, and the elves believed that evil was ended forever, and it was not so. Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. That's the great hope. Thank you all, all, everyone here for helping us bring a little more light
to help us fight against the darkness a little more effectively. So thank you all. Thank you all. Mark? You spoke for me. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all.